Preface and Chapter One of With Sack and Stock in Alaska. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. With Sack and Stock in Alaska by George Broke. Preface the publishing of these simple notes is due to the wishes of one who is now no more but for this they would probably have never seen the light and i feel therefore that less apology is needed for their crudeness and diariness than would otherwise have been the case chapter one london to sitka on the twenty fifth of april eighteen eighty eight i was playing golf on our little links at home and had driven off for the style hole situated on the lawn tennis ground when i observed the butler emerge from the house with an orange envelope in his hand and come towards me across the lawn having with due deliberation played a neat approach shot over the railings on to the green i climbed over after it putted out the hole and then went to meet him the telegram proved to be from my friend harold t with whom at sauce in the previous summer i had discussed seton carr's book on alaska and we had both come to the conclusion that we should much like to go there finding that i should have the summer of eighty eight at my disposal i had written to him at the end of march to ask about his plans and now got this telegram in reply it was sent from victoria british columbia and was an urgent appeal to join him and his brother at once as they meant to make an attempt on mount st elias that summer and must start northward by the end of may i retired to the smoking-room to consider the situation and finally came to the conclusion that such a hurried departure might be managed i crossed over to brussels where i was then posted packed up all my goods and chattels left masses of ppc cards and returned again three days later the afternoon of may eleventh found me on board the allen liner polynesian at liverpool i was fortunate in making some very charming acquaintances among the few saloon passengers on board and though the good ship did not belie her sobriquet of roly-poly we had a very pleasant crossing till the seventeenth when we got into a horrible cold wet fog the temperature on the deck not rising above thirty four degrees for two days while for about twelve hours we ran along the edge of and occasionally through thin field ice all broken into very small pieces about noon on the eighteenth we sighted land to the north covered with snow and entered the gulf of st lawrence next day we stopped off ramuski to pick up our pilot at lunchtime on whit sunday a lovely day but very cold and having left summer in england we seemed to have returned suddenly into winter next morning we awoke to find ourselves at quebec as we brought nine hundred emigrants and the oregon and carthaginian came in at the same time there was a mob of over two thousand despairing passengers at the landing stage station hunting wildly for their luggage i abandoned the conflict and went round the town calling at the post office in hopes of hearing something from h but there was nothing which was not very wonderful as though i had telegraphed to say i was coming i had not indicated my route in any way so i returned and collected my things and after a successful interview with the customs officials got the greater part of them checked to vancouver and conveyed the remainder to the railway station where i found my friends of the voyage there was a train to montreal at half past one but it was very crowded and we fell victims to the blandishments of a parlor car conductor who represented to us that his car would be attached to the emigrant special which would leave at three o'clock and reach montreal as soon if not sooner than the ordinary train as it would run right through we fell into the snare deposited our properties in the car and went off into town again returning punctually at three alas there was no sign of the emigrant train and it did not leave till six while its progress even then was of the most contemptible character stopping for long periods at benighted little stations so that we did not reach montreal till three in the morning fortunately we had furnished ourselves with biscuits potted meat etc including whiskey and so did not actually starve but we were all very cross the ladies especially 
and though the train was going to continue its weird journey we declined to have anything more to do with it and hurried up to the big hotel where we were soon wrapped in dreamless slumbers which lasted so long that we very nearly came under the operation of a stern rule which decreed that no breakfasts should be served after half-past ten after seeing as much of the city as we could during the day we had an excellent dinner drove down in plenty of time to catch the eight thirty pacific train and ensconced ourselves in the recesses of a most admirable sleeping car the name of which was i fancy the sydney the c p r berths are most comfortable and so wide in many cases two people are willing to share one but the greater part of dressing and undressing has to be done inside the berth as in all pullments which is inconvenient till you get used to it in this respect the gentlemen are better off than the ladies as we were able to make use of the smoking-room which was next our lavatories while i fancy the ladies accommodation was much more circumscribed the next day was very hot and was spent in running past little lakes and through marshy forest called muskeg or peatland early in the morning we picked up an excellent dining car in which we breakfasted lunched and dined most luxuriously the intervals of the day being occupied with whist tobacco and light literature on the following morning we found ourselves skirting the northern edge of lake superior enjoying superb scenery as the line followed the curves of the rock-bound shore that day we had the best dining car of the whole trip which unfortunately was taken off after lunch and we had to content ourselves with high tea at Saban but a far greater disaster awaited us next morning for on inquiring for our breakfast at a fairly early hour we heard that an ill-mannered goods train had run into it in the night as it was peaceably waiting for us and had reduced it to a heap of disintegrated fragments this was a pretty state of things but i had been warned beforehand that such calamities were sometimes to be met with and so our party were prepared setting up an etna inside a biscuit tin so as to guard against the possibility of disaster from the jolting of the carriage we brewed our tea and made a comfortable meal off biscuits potted meat sardines and marmalade while the rest of the passengers who seemed to have neglected these precautions glared upon us in hungry envy however we reached winnipeg at noon and they rushed in a tumultuous body to the refreshment room here we overtook that ghastly train in which we had started from quebec and some waifs and strays were recovered which the ladies had left behind at porridge la prairie a dining car was attached and we were enabled to get our evening meal in peace next morning saturday we secured our travelling restaurant at a place called moose jaw about six o'clock at least i was told so and here i wish to protest against the insane habit of early rising which seems to possess the passengers on the c p r i am an early riser myself in fact i pique myself on it but in this car i was always the last with the exception of one of my friends a young englishman ranching at calgary by seven o'clock the babble of voices and the noise made by our colored attendant as he stowed away the beds compelled one to get up which was unkind if one had been talking and smoking till one or two a m one could however always get a nap in the smoking-room that day we had quite a shocking dinner car so bad that i hereby publish its name which was sandringham in the hope that the cuisinal director of the c p r whoever he may be will have taken care to reform that car before i next meet with it as our calgary friend got off the train at two a m some of us sat up till that hour to see him off but we turned out again at four o'clock to enjoy the grand scenery of the rockies into the heart of which we crept up the bow river over the kicking horse pass down to donald and then we crossed the columbia and began to climb the valley of the beaver into the selkirk range this is even finer than the rockies owing to the greater size of the snowfields and glaciers and the view from glacier house where we stopped for lunch the grades in the mountains being too steep to allow for a dining car being attached was magnificent in the extreme at this point the great illisillooetta glacier descends into the valley backed by the superb spire of mount sir donald 
and the cpr have most obligingly built a summer track outside the snow sheds to enable the passengers to see it in comfort it was on this day that we crossed the trestle bridge in the beaver valley two hundred ninety five feet above the stream below two of us happened to be sitting at the time on the step of the car and as the bridge which has no parapet or floor of any kind is curved we were tipped forward till we could contemplate the water far beneath between our feet as they overhung the edge of the step we held on rather tight during the minute or so spent in creeping over it this sitting on the step of the platform was most enjoyable as there had been rain in the night and consequently there was no dust but every now and then the one who was sitting farthest from the projecting roof of the carriage received an icy shower bath as the train dashed suddenly into a snow shed through the roof of which the melting snow was dripping and little feminine squeals might be heard intermixed with deeper bass grumblings at glacier house i received a letter from h saying that they could not start for another fortnight and recommending me to stop off there for a day or two and go up the glacier but as all my climbing things were in my checked baggage i preferred to go on we were detained an hour or so by a disobliging boulder which had playfully rolled down on to the track and had to be removed with dynamite before we could proceed and then we went down over some marvellous loops which resembled the twistings of the st gothard near wasson crossed the columbia again and climbed up into the gold range from revelstoke to sycamus we were accompanied by a dining car but our dinner would perhaps have been more satisfactory though more devoid of interest had they not selected the moment at which we were running fast down a steep incline to jam the brakes on away went every wine glass soup hopped out of the plates potatoes out of the dishes and we might as well have been in a rough sea with no fiddles on at last peace and as much of the dinner as could be collected were restored late in the evening we enjoyed a most lovely view over the broad smooth expanse of lake susrope the train running along its reedy shore for some time during the night we careered down the thompson and found ourselves at daybreak accompanying the fraser on its wild career to the sea we were compelled to breakfast at north bend at the objectionable hour of seven and my toilet was hurried in a very undue manner but the views all that morning were ample compensation for having been dragged out of bed all this time i had no conception of where h was his letter having said nothing but in london i had been given an address in the town of vancouver and so had determined to go there first being a monday no boat ran to victoria from vancouver and so i had to part with my friends and nearly all the other passengers at westminster junction whence they went on to new westminster i reached vancouver at two o'clock and after securing comfortable not to say luxurious quarters in the brand new c p r hotel strolled down to find out about h and discovered that he and his brother were located at the famous driard hotel in victoria the afternoon was spent in wandering about the town the evening in smoking at the house of a hospitable fellow-countryman and the next day the little steamer yosemite conveyed me across the blue waters of the gulf of georgia muddied in one place by the flood of the fraser to victoria a distance of about seventy miles we had an exciting race with the old cunarder abyssinia now employed in the mail service between canada and japan she moved first from her moorings in burrard islet but her head was lying the wrong way and before she got round we were out of the harbour with a quarter of a mile start down the long straight piece that followed she gained slowly but steadily and was almost level with us on our left when we just succeeded in getting into plumper's pass first and in the intricate windings of this tortuous channel where the ship kept spinning round in little over her own length we again got a long start which was gradually reduced till there was nothing of it left as we neared the southeast point of vancouver island but here we cut inside a group of small islands where apparently the larger vessel could not come and this time we gained such an advantage that we were not caught again we steamed round the corner into the very beautiful harbour of victoria and reached the wharf at half past eight here i was met by h apprised by telegraph of my approach and really hardly recognized him without his moustache 
which for some obscure reason he had chosen to shave off while staying at glacier house in the spring having entrusted my baggage to an express man we did not go up at once to the driard as it was too late to procure dinner or indeed anything else to eat there but repaired to the poodle dog where my hunger was at last appeased we then proceeded to the hotel where we found e h s brother and most unlike him and talked over plans far into the night a fourth man w an american member of the alpine club was coming to join us but the taking of his degree was delaying him still he did his best for us by sending us long telegrams of advice every day the next few days passed rapidly the mornings being spent in shopping though that was a task which fell chiefly to h who had been elected boss of the party or in frantic endeavours to ascertain how we were going to get from sitka to yakutat a distance of nearly three hundred miles we entered into negotiations with the owners of two steam schooners but as one asked fifty dollars a day and the other four thousand for the whole trip we rejected these noble offers the afternoons were spent by e and me in sailing on the harbour in plungers stiff little una rigged cutters which revealed the meaning of their name if there was any sea on or in tennis lawns in the gardens of various hospitable magnates of victoria at the house of one of these i encountered an old friend a neighbour at home whose ship was now on the station and i had the pleasure of dining with him on board at eskimo the next evening there was great uncertainty even about the arrival of the ancon the steamer which was to take us up to sitka she was expected to arrive early on the fourth of june but did not turn up till the evening of the fifth crammed with american tourists with the utmost difficulty we obtained a fairly airy but exceedingly diminutive cabin for at first we found ourselves condemned to a pocket edition of the black hole each tried to make us believe that the majesty of his presence had overawed the purser but we somehow fancied that bribery and corruption had something to do with it in consequence of this mob of passengers there were three breakfasts three lunches etc a most horrible arrangement while at all of them the food was bad and the waiting worse thus we grumbled little thinking with what enthusiasm the same cookery would be received on our return as a sea voyage this trip up to sitka is quite unique though possibly travelling among the fjords of norway might be compared to it in quality if not in quantity for these little steamers travel about eight hundred miles between victoria and sitka only about thirty miles of which the crossing of queen charlotte sound can in any sense be termed open sea though the whole of it is on salt water the whole coast up to cape spencer is fringed with a mass of islands separated by deep and very narrow channels in some instances so narrow that as in the case of peril straits and seymour narrows even a steamer can only pass them at slack water one american gentleman assured me that in the latter strait the tide had been known to run seventeen knots all these islands are densely wooded with conifers among which may every now and then be detected the white streak of a waterfall racing down the steep hillside we stopped to coal at nanaimo and while this objectionable process was going on h and i spent the afternoon in drifting about the harbour in an indian canoe a dugout about twelve feet long managed in just the same way as the canadian canoes we have in england and in endeavouring to acquire some chinook the jargon invented more or less by the old traders and used all over british columbia and the southern part of alaska it contains chiefly indian words most of which are common to various different tribes a few english a few russian and a good many french words such as siwash i e sauvage for indian and saumon for any kind of fish then for six days it rained at intervals while a grey pall of cloud stretched ceaselessly over our heads and we spent most of our time playing whist or euchre in our cabin which would just hold four people our fourth on these occasions was a most cheerful scotchman known to us as the king of kaziar to which kingdom he was now returning he possessed a large stock of most excellent whisky when he came on board during these sad and gloomy days we visited sundry salmon canneries 
and about midnight on sunday the tenth we arrived at wrangell we had now got so far north that there was quite light enough even at that hour to walk about the streets and i accompanied our scotch friend ashore as he was to leave us here and go up the stikeen river while in the town i gleaned the information that canoes went up almost every summer from hunia to yakutak along the unprotected part of the coast and we proceeded to sketch out our plans for conveying our expedition in the same way the next day was still wet and cold and though we met sundry small icebergs floating down from the glaciers in taku inlet we saw nothing of the mountains which gave them birth some excitement was caused by our stopping about eleven o'clock to pick up a fair-sized canoe with four of mr dungan's metlakatla indians in her who had encountered rough weather and damaged their frail craft we reached the mining city of juno in the evening and h and i plunged about till late at night seeking with the assistance of mr reed a juno storekeeper for some sloop or schooner which might convey us to yakutat this we failed to find but we engaged a certain dick as interpreter who was said to be the smartest indian in alaska and rejoiced in the appellation of the dude for this aristocratic siwash's services we weakly consented to pay four dollars a day and his food and he accompanied us on board his luggage being about as voluminous as that of a swiss guide on tuesday the twelfth we had at last a perfectly beautiful day during which we steamed from douglas island the seat of the biggest gold mine in alaska up the lynn canal to pyramid harbor the mountains on each side of the narrow inlet were covered with glaciers all obviously shrinking and none of any great size till we came to the davidson glacier close to pyramid harbor which at a distance appears to come right into the sea though it is really separated from it by a narrow belt of moraine retracing our course next day down the lynn canal we then went down chatham strait to killisnoo where i saw the biggest salmon that i ever came across in alaska a brace of about fifty pounds each and then passing through most beautiful scenery in peril straits finally reached sitka at eleven p m end of preface and chapter one Chapter Two of With Sack and Stock in Alaska by George Broke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Chapter Two Sitka to Yakutat. As we were detained at Sitka for a fortnight, making preparations for the expedition and waiting for W to come up on the next boat, I may as well give some description of one of the most beautiful places I have ever seen as the traveller lands on the pier he has the indian village of about five hundred inhabitants on his left while just in front are the barracks of the united states marines and the old russian citadel from the top of which he will obtain a lovely view somewhat resembling that of the bay of naples but with the additional charm of the snow-covered mountains and small glaciers at the head of silver bay numbers of small green islands stretch across its mouth while further away to the west lies Kruzoff island humping itself into the dormant volcano of mount edgecombe and the double summit of the camel's back due east and almost overshadowing the town rises the sharp peak of verstovia so called by the russians from its being supposed to be exactly a verst about three thousand feet high but the translation of the indian name is arrowhead to the northeast lies the little pool of swan lake above which the forest-clad hills sweep up again to the height of about two thousand feet while across the bay to the south rise mountains of very respectable proportions as he goes on up the main street our traveller sees on the left a broad grassy place beyond which are the remains of towers and stockades now no longer required to keep out the hostile siwash while on the right are a row of stores of which one or two are still the old log buildings erected by the first inhabitants he then passes the simple but hospitable little baranoff hotel on his left and finds himself in front of the greek church the main feature of sitka brilliantly though rather tawdrily decorated inside its service on sunday was impressively conducted 
and was well attended by many of the older indians and by the few russians left in sitka the road continues along the shores of the bay to the indian river a broad rapid stream foaming in places over ledges of rock the ground in its neighborhood has been reserved as a sort of public park and though wild and uncared for presents pictures of great beauty but though beautiful the town is very diminutive and its permanent white population does not i should think amount to more than one hundred souls we had a letter of introduction to mr vanderbilt one of the sitka merchants and after securing rooms at the aforesaid hotel went to interview him with decidedly satisfactory results his partner mr de groff was at the time at yakutat where he had established a small store and was supervising some gold mining that had been commenced in the black sand on the shore his small schooner the alpha was expected back every day from sealing and as soon as she returned she would be sent up to yakutat with stores for his partner and could take us as passengers at that time we did not intend to take any white men trusting that we should be able to get canoes and porters at yakutat dick being the medium of communication we then decided to go on a little training expedition and selected a sharp peak we had noticed from the steamer in approaching sitka and had set down as between seven and eight thousand feet high to reach this we departed one afternoon in a fair-sized canoe with its owner and dick and rowed for most of these large canoes are fitted with oars in a northerly direction for about six miles until we reached the mouth of a narrow bay known as nuskwashinsky or nushanitsky here the wind though light was in our favor and we sailed peaceably up it reaching its head about seven o'clock and camped by a broad stream along which we had at first thought we could make our way towards our mountain which the indian informed us was called shaklok or spear peak but the bush in the valley was so dense that we struck straight up next morning till in about four hours we got above tree level and pitched camp at a height of about two thousand feet close to a big bed of snow next day we climbed our peak triumphantly in about three hours and even put on the rope to cross a big snow patch hanging on the face but its height proved to be only four thousand three hundred feet so easily is one deceived at first in a new country we built a big stone man on the top which we afterwards found was visible with a glass from the bay and returned to the tents where we spent most of the afternoon in slumber at this camp we got one or two deer and took a lot of venison back to sitka intending to dry it and take it north but unfortunately it all went bad in the moist atmosphere our next expedition was to Kruzov and mount edgecombe and this time we had rather a sickener as we had about fifteen miles of much more open sea we took a bigger canoe and had to pull the beastly thing all the way so landed in the first place that came handy a very awkward landing with a lot of big rocks about from the appearance of clouds of mosquitoes in the evening dick prophesied bad weather and he was right for it poured the whole of the next day most of which we spent in the tent in the afternoon i went out to look for deer but the bush was so dense that it was impossible to get through it silently and though i just glimpsed a couple as they started away i couldn't even get a snap shot and return a bread to eel in a very dripping condition the following day the weather was not quite so adverse though there was still plenty of rain and getting our canoe afloat we rowed for an hour and a half along the beach till we reached a spot where the men said the bush was not so thick in this they were right but the ground was broken into countless ravines which always seemed to be at right angles to our course and getting up and down the slippery sides of these with a heavy knapsack on one's back proved rather exhausting so that the afternoon was well advanced by the time we began to climb the steeper slopes of edgecombe itself at last we came on a small clear space in the middle of the thick scrub and though no level spot could be found for the tent we decided to pitch camp a lot of cedar boughs were cut and arranged as evenly as possible for our bed and after we had fried with bacon and disposed of a ptarmigan each had picked off with his rifle as we came up we made what the indians call a white man's fire 
and so got warm if not dry before crawling into our blankets for the night on the previous evening we had made a nondescript meal off of cockles and gum boots a large species of chitin found adhering to the rocks the indians were very fond of these and attributed soporific powers to them but i certainly cannot recommend them for they resemble nothing more than the india rubber after which they are named being absolutely tasteless and appallingly tough it rained all night but the edgington tent stood it well very little coming through and that i fancy only where carelessness had left some article touching the canvas with a view to assisting the commissariat department we separated in the morning e and h going up to the top of edgecombe and securing two more ptarmigan on the way they found the bottom of the shallow crater covered with snow and on the summit itself encountered the tracks of one of the enormous alaska brown bears ursus richardsonii i took dick towards the camel's back but we never saw a sign of deer or bear and so about two o'clock i turned to come home giving him the rifle that he might make a last effort to procure venison i had no doubt about being able to find my way back for i had taken my bearings carefully and a fair-sized dead tree standing in the middle of our small clearing afforded a capital landmark i went at a fair pace and though all the ravines were very much alike i presently felt pretty sure i was nearing camp an opinion confirmed in a minute or two by hearing as i thought the crooning song of the indian we had left behind still no dead tree appeared and thinking i must have been mistaken i pushed on for another quarter of an hour by which time i felt sure i had gone far enough i struggled up the mountain i scrambled down i shouted and yelled i had an exciting chase after a couple of ptarmigan one of which i managed to bag with my revolver but nowhere could i see this mangy tree and began to feel very unhappy as it was gradually borne in on me that i was very decidedly lost at last i saw far below me two tiny lakes which we had passed on the previous day and decided to go down to them as i felt pretty sure i could make camp from there hardly had i descended a hundred yards when i came into the corner of a clearing and heard e's voice and then the mystery was explained the other indian with praiseworthy but most mistaken industry had cut down the dead tree for firewood it had rained all day and in the night a tremendous southwest gale came on which proved the last straw and we settled to return to sitka where we were going to dismiss the dude with whom we had had a row he had accidentally left his blankets on the beach by the canoe and though we had lent him one of ours he was very dissatisfied and apparently coming to the conclusion that serving us was not likely to be all beer and skittles announced that he was not coming to yakutat we made no attempt to get him to change his mind for we had already come to the conclusion that he had much too good an opinion of himself and was more than a little lazy though he was an entertaining conversationalist and gave us interesting scraps of information either social such as the number of slaves he had till quite recently possessed or geographical such as that twenty-one miles up the copper river a glacier stretches across its whole width a phenomena which existed on the Sikine till comparatively lately he added that the river was two miles wide at this point and that a portage of fifteen miles across the ice was made by the indians with skin canoes or bedarkies but as he had never been there i am inclined to doubt his details although we were unanimous as to the expediency of dismissing him we were not all so united as to how he was to be replaced and became indeed a little despondent as to whether we should get further than yakutat so that had we been able to communicate by telegraph with w i am not at all sure that the expedition would not have then and there come to an end and the members of it taken refuge in the selkirks luckily we had to wait for him and in the interval more cheerful counsels prevailed meanwhile we packed down again to the canoe the wind was very high and there was a lot of sea but the men thought that as the wind was fair we might venture and after lunch off a confiding grouse which had fallen victim to e's rifle we started and found that whether we liked it or not 
we had got to go on as returning to the island in the teeth of the gale was quite impossible the rollers were enormous but with a little scrap of sail we flew along finely and in about two hours were back in sitka harbor the next few days were spent chiefly in endless confabulations with various white men and indians who were willing to accompany us as porters which resulted in the engagement of two white men lyons and mcconaughey and four sitka indians the former to receive three the latter two dollars a day and their food e and i occupied ourselves one morning in the ascent of verstovia we left at four o'clock along the indian river by a fair trail for about an hour and then crossing the stream by a fallen tree struck up to the right through the most abominable bush full of devil's clubs an exceedingly evil plant with large green leaves and scarlet berries covered as to the stem and backs of the leaves with minute prickles which penetrate the human skin with unpleasant facility and if left in cause festering sores it was steamingly hot in the low ground but we struggled up somehow or rather i did the struggling for e appeared provokingly cool while i was dripping and breathless and eventually reached the top of the sharp rocky cone which forms the highest peak at half past seven getting just scrambling enough in the last hundred feet to find our rifles rather a nuisance as we had been told we should take at least six hours we were rather pleased with ourselves and after spending an hour on the top and setting up a flagstaff left there some years before by a party of marines we descended leisurely by the west face instead of by the northwest ridge up which we had come and got back to sitka just after eleven at last the alpha returned from sealing with one hundred nineteen skins on board and was beached for repairs she was followed the next day by the elder which brought w and after two or three days packing and arranging we actually started on tuesday july third at ten thirty a m about half of the slender population of sitka came down to see us off and to wish us every success while the little five-and-twenty-ton schooner was beating out between the islands against the fresh northwest breeze we discovered that we were being pursued and soon afterwards a boat came up bringing an american flag provided by the kindness of mr hayden the acting governor and we accordingly hoisted the stars and stripes at the masthead mrs hayden had previously presented us with a small silk flag to be left on the summit of mount st elias if we ever got there dinner was soon announced and we proceeded below but recoiled from the fearful heat and smell caused by the want of ventilation in the cabin in which was the cooking stove e who was proof against anything remained below but h w and i retired to the deck where we ate our meals during the greater part of our voyage shortly afterwards we three yielded to the gruesome attacks of seasickness as the little vessel was now pitching freely w who had often cruised off the east coast of the united states in small yachts soon recovered but h and i remained more or less prostrate the whole time we were on board the wind was dead ahead west by north magnetic and our craft made so much leeway that our onward progress was insignificant next morning under a gray sky we were only fifteen miles from sitka edgecombe was still in sight the morning after that and it was not till friday the sixth that we sighted mount fairweather and Crillon, some sixty miles off and right ahead next day we were only about twenty miles from them and went tacking steadily up the coast the glories of which were veiled in almost constant rain and cloud without making much progress on sunday we at last got past latuya bay near which we saw a hummingbird in the evening the wind which we now regarded as a personal enemy since blowing from the northwest it ought at least to have brought fine weather began to die away and at about two in the morning a vigorous southeaster sprang up so that we flew along finely in the right direction at last but to our intense disgust captain jimmy whose only fault was over caution perhaps a natural one in these very dangerous coasts hove to fearing lest we might be driven ashore in the thick weather that prevailed in the evening the wind collapsed and we got a glimpse of a land as to the identity of which there rose a considerable argument 
but on the whole those who had been there before held the opinion that we were about thirty miles from ocean cape which view proved correct as next morning which was more or less fine we were only ten miles off mount st elias and the range as far east as mount vancouver were visible but swathed in clouds their height did not impress us much at first sight but we were greatly struck with the enormous mass of the malaspina glacier the white upper part of which presented such a curiously regular appearance that at first we believed it to be a layer of cloud till undeceived by the telescope there was hardly any wind but we crept round to cape phipps at last and came in sight of yakutat once round the corner the light breeze from the west sent us along faster and we were soon abreast of the ranch on contag island great was the excitement among our men there's de groff and calson and dalton we hoisted our flag but the halyards got entangled and the stars and stripes were an unsightly ball omen perhaps of what was to befall us for as we rounded the point at the end of the island we kept a little too far out the tide ebbing swiftly through the narrow channel caught our bows and we ran hard and fast on to a rocky shoal instead of sailing into the harbour known as port mulgrave we were evidently a fixture till the tide rose again and so went ashore in the hope of finding strawberries in which we were disappointed as though there were any number of plants the indian women and children had been beforehand with us and we only collected a meagre half dozen we made the acquaintance of mr de groff vanderbilt's partner and so part owner of the alpha a short rather good-looking man with blue eyes and fair hair and beard our siwashes soon found friends and relations in the village and we agreed to pay them board wages at the rate of one dollar twenty-five per day for the lot while mcconaughey shorty and lyons were to be fed with us on the alpha another little schooner the three brothers of kayak island was in the harbour when we arrived but took her departure next day there being some alarm as to whether the water would not come in and damage our stores when the schooner floated we at first resolved to sit up but eventually we gave it up and turned in about midnight she was got off and beached in front of the ranch without our knowing anything about it and without taking in any water from this point onwards i give the events just as they are noted in my diary end of chapter two chapter three of with sack and stock in alaska by george broke this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf chapter three opening approaches wednesday the eleventh h spent a large part of the day in interviewing the chief billy masterman on the subject of canoes and men we also engaged two white men who with several others had come prospecting up the coast from juneau in a whale boat but had done no good and were anxious to return in the alpha ed i never knew his other name was tall and dark finn commonly called the doctor was a smaller red-haired man both seemed rather slight for packing but had the reputation of being good cooks as they were repairing the schooner we pitched the green tent on the beach and h w and i slept in it e who had a slight cold preferring to remain on board thursday the twelfth we managed to engage two large canoes one of which was to wait at icy bay for us its owner agreed to this on the condition that he was to stay with it and with him a youth who was said to be his son but who subsequently proved to be his brother crews were also secured and we were to have started at three but there was some wind and they declined to go w and i went off and bathed and then wandered a little way along the beach after a small variety of plover of which we had seen a good many the day before but now they all seemed to have vanished as we returned however we came on a small flock dick de goff's setter pup spoiled the shot by chasing them but i got four and he made some amends by fetching them out of the sea this outer shore of cantag island is a regular shingle beach exposed to the surf 
h and i went along it the day before about a mile to de groff's and calson's gold claim where they were washing the black sand or as some call it the ruby sand from the quality of garnets in it in an amalgamator but they were doing little more than would pay their expenses in the evening the indians suddenly announced their readiness to start and at nine o'clock we got off in the two big canoes and a smaller one which we had purchased for five dollars from one of the miners returning to sitka on the alpha we were arranged thus in the large canoe we were to keep at icy bay were e and w with ed lyons billy jimmy and three yakutats in the other h and i was shorty matthew mike and five yakutats and in the small one finn and two yakutats de goff photographed us from the beach and we started the indians yelling wildly and the two big canoes racing till we were past the point when they settled down to a more sedate stroke off cape phipps however the weather looked so threatening in the southeast that we returned ignominiously at half past ten we put up our tent on the sand in front of the ranch everything else was left in the canoes ready for a start with the sails etc stretched over them to protect them from the rain which came down in torrents in the middle of the night the tent collapsed at w s end and he had to emerge in the wet and fasten it again in much peril from the siwash dogs which we heard growling indignantly as he disturbed their slumbers in search for something solid to which to attach the rope while we chuckled inside and congratulated ourselves that we did not sleep next the door in the morning we found the sand beneath us swarming with maggots bred from the refuse which the indians used to cast on the beach the warmth of our bodies had presumably brought them to the surface friday the thirteenth next day the weather looked better and after hiring two more yakutats who were put in the small canoe while finn was transferred to ours we got off again at eleven a m we rowed round the point and some little way up the bay when we set sail there was a strong northeast wind and the small canoe was soon a good way behind about half past three we were off point manby things looked rather bad with dense black clouds to the southeast so we waited for the others to come up and held a council of war shorty who was always on the safe side strongly urged our going ashore pointing out that there was no landing between point manby and icy bay a distance of over thirty miles and that should it come on to blow from the southeast it would probably be impossible to land through the surf by the time we reached the latter place we should be unable to turn back against the wind and our only chance would be to run right on before it in which case we would be carried on to kayak unless we swamped by the way unwilling as we were to land at point manby which if the weather became bad would involve a detention of unknown length and would in any case cause much confusion among our stores by our having to land and then re-embark them h and i were inclined to agree with him but e and w so strongly opposed it pointing out with justice that the similar appearance of the evening before had only resulted in heavy rain that we gave way and decided to go on thereby as i believe running the biggest risk encountered on the whole expedition fortunately the others were right the wind died down causing the men to take to their oars and was succeeded by a deluge of rain after which the northeast wind came again and our canoe took the small one in tow all this time we were running along the face of the agassi or rather the malaspina glacier for it is all one field of ice which here seems quite motionless its front covered with gravel and boulders among which appear a few sparse bushes at last we reached a point which we recognized as cape sitkagi from the delta of flat land which commenced just beyond and gums one of the yakutats who had been with the former expedition indicated that we were near our destination going on some five or six miles further we prepared to land from our men's accounts of surf landings and from seaton carr's book we were prepared for a fearful struggle with the waves shorty transferred himself to the little canoe 
and they went ashore without apparent difficulty but then she was small and light then came our turn and h and i went up into the bows with instructions to jump the moment she touched and should she get broadside on and capsize to be careful to jump to sea so as not to be pounded between the canoe and the beach after these cheerful directions we were a shade nervous as we contemplated the shore which we were now rapidly approaching while the other stood ready to receive us but as we got closer we came to the conclusion that the breakers were very small and before we touched our contempt for the pacific surf in its then condition was complete we were now quite close the indians paused for a favorable moment and then dashed in their paddles with wild yells we rode in on the crest of a wave and were swept up the beach as it broke instantly the others grasped the canoe and then ensued a scene of wildest confusion every man seized the first thing he could lay hold of rushed up the beach with it tossed it down and ran back for more till the canoe was empty when we hauled her up a little way and prepared to receive the others who were not quite so fortunate for as they touched land another breaker came in over their stern but did no damage the beach was now strewn with our properties which were gradually collected and conveyed beyond the reach of the highest tide where we pitched camp and the canoes were dragged up it was now nine o'clock but quite light and some of the indians went off after seals which had been seen at the mouth of a small river just to the east of us a good deal of firing was heard and according to their account they shot three but unfortunately these were all lost in the sea saturday the fourteenth the morning was spent in sorting and arranging the stores with the object of remaining as long as possible in the vicinity of the mountain we four agreed to carry our own properties so that the men might be free to carry more food and soon came to the conclusion that we must leave our rifles at the beach w and e tried to take one between them but left it at the first cache we saw a green hummingbird flashing along shore and another had been observed at yakutat in the afternoon we all sallied forth to explore the neighborhood h and ed went along the beach which was covered with bear tracks for some four miles to the outlet of the river rechristened by lieutenant schwatka with the euphonious name of jones and ed returned considerably impressed with the walking powers of our gallant captain e and shorty penetrated with great difficulty for some distance along the banks of the river which ran into the sea close to camp i took the shotgun and started with w and lyons along the beach but i soon separated from them and went on the shore side of the lagoons where i hoped to find duck in this i was disappointed but i shot a large sandpiper and a couple of ring-necked plover on the sand hills of the beach were the largest wild strawberries i ever saw some fully as big as a shilling while the supply was utterly inexhaustible it came on to pour in torrents and we all returned soaked through and quite undecided as to our future route all that night the rain descended in a deluge and driven by a fierce east wind even succeeded in penetrating our excellent green tent which had stood so well on mount edgecombe sunday the fifteenth in the morning the men showed no sign of life so after a cold breakfast h and w sallied forth to see whether it would be possible to pack up the river by our camp while e and i curled up again in our blankets about two p m the rain began to leave off and the men emerged and made a fire for lunch we fried some seal meat the indians having been successful in shooting one the day before h and w returned dripping at three o'clock in time to share our repast and reported that the bush was too dense to pack through so we decided to start early next morning and follow the same route as the schwatka party in the evening e announced the presence of two plover by the river close to camp so i executed a stalk through the sand which brought me within easy shot but trying to get both at once i missed with the first barrel and only secured one then i plucked and cleaned my four birds and we fried them with bacon for supper monday the sixteenth fine at last and some sunshine 
we had a grand view of st elias through the clouds which gradually cleared off and we were able at our leisure to survey the monarch who looked most formidable but we hoped he would improve on acquaintance though we were up at five there was so much to be done that it was not till eight that the procession began its march along the sand hills as it was the first day the men were not used to their burdens of from sixty to eighty pounds and could only go about two miles an hour in addition to which they stopped to rest every three or four hundred yards as some of the indians seemed to be overburdened i went back to h who had not yet started and we hired for the day three of the other yakutats at the site of schwatka shore camp we picked up a short forty four cartridge and a piece of sheet lead while resting there i suddenly perceived a bear cantering along the other side of the lagoon about five hundred yards off shorty who was carrying his rifle which was also left at the first cache was anxious to go in pursuit but h declined to allow this as being a waste of valuable time progressing very slowly and halting continually to attack the strawberries we at length reached the first river at half past eleven seton carr recommends the ascent of this but it looked very unpromising and we kept on most of the men stripped more or less to cross this stream which was well over our knees and horribly cold but as we knew there would be lots more waiting none of us four took the trouble of taking off boots or stockings in an hour more across a flat grassy plain with scattered fir trees we reached a creek of the main river and halted for lunch after which the fun began the streams were not deep being seldom above our knees but their beds and generally the spaces in between were of that terrible glacier mud as glutinous as quicksands and through this we toiled every now and then skirting the edge of the forest where a scanty vegetation of sedge and mare's tails gave a little sounder going and resting whenever a fallen log or two offered something substantial to sit on presently it began to rain heavily gums pointed out a spot where he declared schwatka halted the first day but this disagreed with seton carr's account and as it was yet early we pushed on in hope of at least finding a dry camping place in this although the moraine of the agassiz glacier was now looming near at hand we were doomed to be disappointed and after two unusually deep and rapid crossings in one of which lyons lost his footing and emerged in a pitiable plight though not with nothing gone except his temper we sought the shelter of the woods thoroughly numbed by this ceaseless wading in ice water such a thing as a flat place was not to be found above the level of the mud but by careful search we discovered a spot where the logs and stones were more or less disguised by a dense layer of moss and pitched the tents with the aid of a couple roaring fires and some excellent pea soup we restored some warmth to our shivering limbs but as it was still pouring dryness was not to be hoped for and decidedly weary with the day's first march we sought our blankets e and i then discovered the deceitfulness of the moss h and w were fairly well off but at our end of the tent an enormous boulder projected with the aid of knapsacks i enlarged the mountain so that i was able to doze more or less on its summit while e curled himself in a ball in the valley at my feet mosquitoes attacked us in myriads but e and w were soon asleep h and i were not so fortunate and i never became enough accustomed to the absence of darkness to sleep well in the middle of the night just as i was dropping off i was suddenly aroused by something tickling my neck and putting up my hand grasped an enormous beetle flinging it from me i promptly massacred it and discovered h eyeing my movements with mild astonishment i explained and we composed ourselves to rest again if not to sleep tuesday the seventeenth next morning we got off at half-past seven 
and continued up the river but with less wading as we were now next the agassiz moraine at one point which must have been very near the site of schwatka's first camp we halted for about an hour while w and h made an attempt to get up the face of the moraine in this they succeeded but only to find the scrub on the glacier itself so dense that it would have been impossible for the packers to penetrate it and we pushed on up the bed of the river gums soon announced that there would be no more waiting to the delight of the men who put on their boots but their joy was turned to wrath when on rounding the next corner we had to plunge in again of course these streams are always changing their bed and we found very great variations in their rise and fall apart from their natural increase by day and decrease by night this was probably to be accounted for by the periodical closing and bursting of the many glacier lakes at last the river began to contract and its bed was now only about a mile wide on the other side was the bare ice of the guyot glacier while we were now driven by the depth of one of the main streams on to the moraine of the agassiz glacier where we halted from half past eleven till two while we had lunch made a cache and dismissed three of our extra yakutats one of whom was the boy who was to stay at icy bay as company for the canoe owner we were now reduced to our proper quota of fourteen and our retainers deserved a somewhat more elaborate description than they have hitherto had of our four whites our right-hand man was arthur mcconaughey nicknamed shorty apparently on the lucas a non lucendo principle being some six feet four inches in height very handsome with fair hair and blue eyes he was the ideal anglo-saxon in appearance and being extremely good-natured he was a favorite with our indians with whom he would readily share his last bit of tobacco but he was an inveterate grumbler and often roused h s wrath by his ceaseless growls against the hardships of the way though the son of an indiana farmer he had been on the pacific coast for some years and being captured in one of the sealers seized in the bering sea had been stranded at sitka without means to get away in may he had been up to yakutat and back in a canoe searching for a lost sloop the leola and the knowledge he thus obtained of the coast proved substantially most useful to me he had however once been shipwrecked near valparaiso when he had a narrow escape of his life being washed up insensible and always had a great distrust of bad weather at sea harry lyons his great friend though not so tall was a man of immense strength with light hair and gray eyes he hailed from iowa and had been for some time a fisherman on the columbia river where he seemed to have had some rather exciting experiences and to have made things exciting for other people too for when one of the steamers was running through his salmon nets he put a bullet into the bridge within a foot of the captain he once got in one haul seven hundred and fourteen salmon each over twenty pounds and also captured the biggest salmon ever taken in the river weighing over seventy-four pounds having lost boat and nets in a storm he had gone in for sealing and when we engaged him he had just come in on the alpha a good packer and a first-rate man in the boat he was terribly lazy in camp not wilfully but it did not seem to occur to him to do things ed and finn were both eastern men the former coming from maine and the latter from erie neither was conspicuous for ardor in packing and it would have been pretty safe to bet on their loads being lighter than other people's but in camp they were very useful especially as bakers ed generally undertook this task and it was not till we were back in yakutat and the baking powder began to run short that we discovered finn's talent for sourdough bread he was a man of considerable education and of a scientific turn of mind with some knowledge of chemistry and botany with ed and three or four others he had come prospecting up the coast from juneau stopping every few miles they had been in disenchantment bay 
a long fjord running inland from the head of yakutat bay and were going on to nuchuk but a few miles west of point manby they were imprisoned on the beach by a storm from the southeast trying to get off too soon they were swamped and barely escaped with their lives luckily for them their boat was not injured and when they got off a day or two later they returned to yakutat as they had lost most of their stores and there we found them of our indians matthew our so-called interpreter was not popular with us he had been a mission boy and accordingly thought a good deal of himself and was inclined to be insolent mike a short burly fellow with a most ruffianly cast of countenance was in reality very good-natured and like all the indians a magnificent packer but he was very slow and somewhat dense billy who had been specially recommended to us by milmore steward to captain newell of the pinta was my favorite among them taller than usual and not at all deformed in the legs he had almost a european cast of countenance jimmy was just the contrary being very small and ugly with much distorted lower limbs both he and billy were extremely strong and on the occasion of my return from camp i to camp j their loads came very near a hundred pounds of the two yakutats who accompanied us gums was quite a character he had been so christened by schwatka from his peculiar smile which revealed not only his teeth but the whole of the interior of his mouth he was the incarnation of undisciplined devilry full of pluck he would rather wade a glacier stream twice over than go a hundred yards round as we often found to our cost when he was professing to guide us up the river if we declined to follow the route he selected or if he thought his burden too great he would get very sulky not to say wrathful but like a child he was easily appeased of the other one george not to be confounded with the second chief of yagatat i recall but little except that on our return he set the fashion of wearing knickerbockers in the village by rolling his trousers up to his knees after the manner of the swiss guides the extreme brilliancy of his striped stockings impressed this fact on my memory after leaving the cache we went on up the stream for about a mile sometimes on little strips of beach but oftener driven by the river onto the face of the moraine which was covered with dense alder scrub offering terrible difficulty to the laden packers as the boughs pressed down by the winter's snow mostly sloped downhill while the foothold on the slope itself was of the most precarious character eventually we left the river and steered to the east hoping to get through to bare ice but the bush seemed to grow thicker and the ubiquitous devil's clubs more numerous at every step at last as we were resting thoroughly sick of creeping and crawling through the tangle w valiantly climbed a somewhat stouter alder than usual and from that eminence which threatened momentarily to collapse with him announced to our intense delight that he could see bare rocks only a few hundred yards ahead summoning up our last energies we soon pushed through and as it was now half past four e and i who were ahead began to search at once for a convenient spot for a camp although on a glacier water was the great desideratum for the ice was here completely covered with rocks and gravel but i was fortunate enough to discover a tiny stream by its sound in a convenient hollow and set to work with e's assistance to level a place for the tent while h and w pushed on a little way to get some idea of our route for the next day it had been discovered that our bacon was fading away too rapidly so we confined ourselves to soup and bread for supper after which the sun came out and held out hopes of improvement in the weather my watch now caused me some annoyance by stopping twice and though it went spasmodically for about a week it then gave out altogether wednesday the eighteenth our luxurious couch of alder boughs did not manage to keep the cold out so that we did not sleep very well and obeyed with alacrity h s reveille at five o'clock it was a glorious morning and we were off by seven in a northerly direction at first 
but the going was so bad that we went back westwards to the depression where the two glaciers joined this agassiz glacier on which it was our miserable fate to meander so much to the great detriment of our boots and our tempers was covered with the worst kind of moraine i have ever encountered not excepting the streets of the city of san francisco at first sight it appeared to consist of mounds of stones but appearances were as usual deceitful for these mounds were in reality ice produced by the effect of weathering and covered with a skin of rocks and dirt which was thick on the north but thin and often altogether absent on the south side plenty of mud lay in the hollows between varied by an occasional moulin and we were rarely able to travel twenty yards in a straight line in the depression it was at first a little better but soon after our lunch of bread and smoked salmon it got much worse so that frequently e and i who were in front had to cut a few steps and in one of these places gums came a most splendid cropper at length we left this and steered east again being much cheered by reaching a comparatively flat region and soon afterwards clear ice we had had a grand view of our mountain all day but it was still too far off for us to make out any possible route on the white ice we progressed much more rapidly though it was anything but level being weathered into hummocks three or four feet high there were not many crevasses and those only a few inches in width by four o'clock we were not more than two miles from the shea hills which we could see were well wooded on their lower slopes but we were steering for a break in them some seven or eight miles off where we hoped might lie the glacier reported by professor libby as coming direct from st elias but the men were thoroughly exhausted and it was evidently impossible to get there that night so we held a council h wisely as it afterwards proved was in favour of sleeping where we were on the glacier and continuing our route next day but the rest of us opposed this frigid course with such warmth that he reluctantly gave way and we accordingly turned northwest to gain the hills and soon got into difficulties again among the stony mounds while when h and i at last reached the edge of the glacier we found ice cliffs varying in height from fifty to a hundred feet utterly cutting us off from the land however i thought i saw a possible place a half a mile or so further up and going on with great difficulty i discovered a spot where the cliffs gave way to a steep slope covered with debris down which we wound our weary way and then waded the inevitable river which always sent us wet to bed on the other side we found a charming camping place on a sort of raised beach marking presumably the height of the river in some former flood but now covered with flowers among which i recognized a large blue lupin mimulus two kinds of spirea and three of willow herb the mosquitoes were also abundant after supper we held a consultation and decided to keep billy and jimmy with us while the rest of the men were to return to the beach for another load and in the meantime we would coast along the east side of the shea hills end of chapter three Chapter Four of With Sack and Stock in Alaska by George Broke. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schempf. Chapter Four: An Attack and a Countermarch. Thursday, the nineteenth. We spent a comfortable night and indulged next morning in the luxury of a long lie. About nine o'clock, the men departed, going downstream along the edge of the hills. This was in opposition to our advice, as we felt sure the ice cliffs would get worse as they approached Lake Castani. But Gums confidently asserted his capability of finding a route, and they thought anything would be better than repeating the toils of the previous day. They would, we reckon, take two days to go down and three to return, so that, allowing them a day's rest at the beach, we might hope to see them again on Tuesday after their departure we reckoned up our stores there was not much bacon but plenty of soup chocolate etc and flour enough for at least a fortnight we then heated water in the big kettle and indulged in the luxury of a good wash 
which was perhaps slightly needed as our scanty ablutions for the last week had been perforce in glacier water which at a temperature of thirty two degrees or so has not much cleansing power after lunch bread and chocolate we took about twenty and the men about forty pounds each and set out to make a cache further up the stream h in addition to his burden attempted to carry the coal oil stove a most detestable fardel but dropped it when he had gone about half a mile for the first three miles our going was fairly easy along the landward side of the stream but we then came to a glacier lake where we surprised a small flock of geese at which h and i fired our revolvers unavailingly we at first attempted the land side of the lake but were soon defeated as the cliffs went sheer down into the water and we had to return wade the stream and climb up onto the debris covered glacier half an hour of this sufficed to bring us to the other side of the lake and we descended again to the river bed up which we proceeded for another three miles wading frequently from side to side so as to make the most of the little bits of beach here the hillside was very steep and with the ice cliffs of the glacier formed a miniature canyon just beyond which we deposited our burdens on a flat bed of gravel and returned rapidly to camp wading the river twelve times between the cache and the lake while we were making the cache e went on a little way and found that the river issued from an ice arch under the glacier from which we hoped that libby's glacier might be near at hand we discovered on our homeward route that it was possible to pass along the lake under the glacier and so to save both time and exertion though at the risk of a falling stone or two we decided that evening to move camp as far as the lake before attempting further exploration just after supper billy who had wandered off a little way downstream rushed back shouting kunch kunch and explaining by saying all same dog we ran out with our pistols but were only in time to see a large wolf vanish into the bushes friday the twentieth we struck camp at seven fifteen and i started first with the men before going far i came on the discarded stove and managed to hoist it along but for this i received no thanks as the others wasted a quarter of an hour in vainly searching for it dropping our loads at the point where the stream issued from the lake billy jimmy and i went back for a fresh lot and buried a letter for shorty directing them to follow us upstream as e had a cold it was thought he had better not do any waiting and he remained in camp to pitch the tent and arrange things generally while h and w went on to explore beyond our cache after lunch the indians went back for the last load while i tried to get round the lake on the land side but i found the rock so dangerous that i abandoned the attempt i am no geologist but it appeared to be a sort of clayey sandstone very hard below but with a soft crust on top which gave way beneath hands feet or ice axe i then went round the lake on the ice side and tried to cross what seemed to be a peninsula between the river and the head of the lake but the ferns and alder scrub on this proved to be so dense that after going some way without being able to see anything i gave that up also and returned to camp at half past three h and w came in at five o'clock having got as far as a second lake whence they were able to see the glacier that descends from st elias though this was still at some distance we felt encouraged and after supper indulged in a little whist w and e played against h and me w's whist was indeed extraordinary and he apparently so confused his partner as eventually to make him revoke in the most palpable manner by trumping clubs and then leading them we never play whist again but confined ourselves to piquet saturday the twenty first a cloudless morning greeted us and at seven thirty we four started out with the firm determination of reaching the long sought glacier we went up the river to the ice arch where we climbed again onto the glacier to turn the second lake when we had gone a little further we halted to sketch and photograph our mountain the upper part of which was showing well over the shea hills 
we then plodded on over the disgusting moraine and at noon reached the point where libby's glacier runs into the agassiz we halted here for lunch and then started to climb it though descending at a considerable angle it was not much broken and in fifty minutes more e w and i slanting across it in an easterly direction reached a green island which so much resembled the gletscher alp at sauce fee that we christened it the Langenflue. on the other side of this there was a grand ice fall with great black seracs h had stayed behind to take some bearings and at first we failed to see him anywhere but soon discovered that he was taking a more direct course up the glacier towards st elias we pushed on and soon joined him on the plateau above here though a little later the ice would doubtless be bare we found some snow patches in the hollows and had to be a little cautious about crevasses fairly on top at last we halted before one of the most magnificent views i ever hoped to see the plateau stretched before us at much the same level for eight or ten miles right to the foot of the mountain which here rose in one appalling precipice put the dom as seen from sauce on top of mount rosa as seen from makunaga and you will have some idea of the grandeur of the spectacle that lay before us to the right rose the double-headed cook seamed with a great couloir down its centre then the rather shapeless mass of vancouver and beyond that numbers of unnamed peaks some of which we thought we recognized as having been noticed at yakutat far away to the east were fairweather and Crillon, clearly defined on the horizon the upper part of our mountain was not so steep as the lower but the whole face was streaming with avalanches the dull boom of which was plainly audible from time to time and on the mountain itself no possible route could be discovered on the south arete rises a very prominent and beautiful peak subsequently christened hayden peak and beneath this were some rocks on which w urged that an attempt might be made but through the big telescope they looked most unpleasant and he yielded to our united advice that we should return on our tracks and circumnavigating the shea hills which from their broken nature it was impossible to cross see what we could do on the southwest side where seton carr had failed after taking observations which afterwards gave the height we had reached as sixteen hundred twenty five feet above the sea we reluctantly left at about four o'clock and tried to improve our return route by keeping down the bed of the stream instead of on the ice till nearly at the second lake but i do not think we gained much as we were then forced onto the glacier in its most unpleasant part we stopped at the cache to bring back some stores and finally reached camp at nine very weary and footsore from the fearful moraine walking which had nearly destroyed one of my two pairs of boots already some tomato soup revived us somewhat and we turned in at half past eleven sunday the twenty second the weather was again perfect and we spent the morning in sketching and similar peaceful occupations but h was not going to allow us the luxury of a whole day's rest and after lunch we packed down again to camp d whence e and i went on downstream following the tracks made by our men on thursday which were plainly visible in the sandy soil in forty minutes we reached lake castani which presented an extraordinary scene the water was very low and enormous bergs lay stranded far up the hill even to the very edge of the timber some of them as much as a hundred feet above the level of the lake we were here much puzzled by the sudden disappearance of the tracks at the water's edge the ice cliffs were as we had expected utterly unscalable and we could only suppose that they had gone round their footprints being invisible on the harder face of the hill we continued along the shore till we had crossed a small stream running in from the north and kept on to the west for some distance when we realized that the lake was in shape something between a broad arrow and a crescent moon and that our best route in the future would be to cut across from horn to horn accordingly we turned inland through the trees and in fifteen minutes reached a beautifully clear little rivulet near which were many flat places well suited for a camp stepping out briskly eighty minutes brought us back to camp at six o'clock where we found the others preparing supper 
monday the twenty third we actually succeeded in getting off at six forty five no light task as it generally took a good two hours to make breakfast including bread baking strike the tents and arrange the packs we coasted round the lake and dropped our loads not on the stream where e and i had been the day before but by a small pond to the left where we could see across castani to the glaciers the indians then returned to d for more things while h e and w started with the hope of finding a way across the hills at our back i had no belief in the possibility of this and went on round the lake to try and find out if possible what had been the route of our other men at the westernmost point of the peninsula projecting into the lake i came on their traces for a few yards when they again vanished at the water's edge oddly enough the true solution never once occurred to us going leisurely i reached at eleven fifteen the northwest extremity of the lake putting up half a dozen geese as i went whose wildness argued considerable knowledge of man i then meditated a return to camp but my plans were suddenly changed by coming on tracks in the herbage which i believed to be those of the men i followed them first over a space where the wind had overthrown all the trees in every direction raising a natural abatis that presented most formidable obstacles and then through some dense alder scrub to the edge of the guyot glacier i supposed they must have gone back by this and as there was no objectionable river cutting me off i thought i might as well go on to the glacier for a bit and ascertain its nature a belt of moraine separated me from the white ice and this moraine was different to that on the agassiz the glacier was much more even and the stones fewer but in the hollows between the mounds lay pools of horrible red mud often knee-deep which made the way anything but a primrose path for the mud was often crusted enough to bear biggish stones and so delude the unwary traveller on to it at length i got beyond this making a slight sketch en route and going up parallel with the hills found myself on white ice but involved in a system of rather formidable crevasses in one of which i nearly came to grief it was at a point where two large crevasses ran together i was between them and as i reached the apex of the triangle from which i intended to jump the ice gave way beneath me and i descended abruptly a distance of some seven or eight feet but the block wedged beneath me saving me from a violent squeeze if not worse though somewhat jarred i had not let go of my axe and chipping a step or two was soon out of my prison a few minutes more brought me to level ice with very few stones on it and i was able to walk very fast on this i had at two o'clock nearly reached the west end of the shea hills which here had subsided into green knolls though a mile or so further back a large lake which with its ramifications and the gorges from them evidently extended far inland must have hopelessly cut off the others had they tried to cross the hills direct i was congratulating myself on my superior astuteness when to my utter amazement i heard shots and discovered the others pursuing ptarmigan on the hills with their revolvers by the time i reached them they had exhausted their few cartridges and i found w anxiously watching over the old hen who obligingly waited till i arrived but unfortunately i also missed and we had no ptarmigan for supper that night the others had failed almost at once in their attempt to cross the hills and so had descended to the glacier and it was their track i had followed through the bush e was very full of a small trout which he had discovered in one of the pools of a tiny rill on the hills and it was certainly a complete marvel what that fish could do with himself in winter when one would think everything would be frozen solid he went back next day captured him and bottled him in alcohol on the hills we all scattered i went across to the other side and had a grand view of st elias across the curve of the tyndall glacier but coming back to the guyot a good deal lower down than where i had left it i found i had missed the others being rather tired i was disinclined to go back so kept on homewards and an hour's moraine and then fifty minutes across the neck of the peninsula on which were one or two pools full of yellow water-lilies brought me into camp at six o'clock pretty well beat 
but i got two loaves made and some apples cooked by the time they arrived an hour later we then had to pitch our tent and it was as usual hard to find a flat place but we managed it at last though the flies and mosquitoes here threatened to be worse than ever tuesday the twenty fourth e and w went off about nine to cut a trail through the worst part of the bush by the guyot glacier and the indians to the east for the last load of stores h and i stayed at home mending our boots and raiment much plagued by the flies of which there were many kinds varying from a large house fly to a microscopic gray beast but all equally anxious to feed off us about eleven i went towards the lake and succeeded in setting fire to a couple of dead trees to serve as a signal to the men whom we were expecting from the beach after this we lunched early off a few beans and then h set off with billy and jimmy to make a cache at the place where we left the bush for the guyot glacier directly afterwards e and w came back and at the same moment we heard shouts across the lake the men had returned e shouted to them to go round by the guyot and i rushed off and cut up h who after the cache had been made set off to meet them while the indians and i returned slowly as it was very hot as the rest of us were having supper a little after six we suddenly saw a figure come in sight round the eastern corner of castani it was the energetic gums followed at intervals by the rest of our men who had failed to understand our cries and had gone on by the agassiz glacier to our old camp at d gums who had sworn he would never go that way again kept his word in the letter if not in the spirit by cutting steps down the cliffs some three hundred yards short of the slope opposite camp down which the others came as they had done before the mystery of their footprints was then explained when they reached the lake its bed was quite dry and they went right across it to the western side where they were able to get on to the ice and the guyot glacier proving much easier than the agassiz they reached b without difficulty the first day the next day they reached the shore going down by the river recommended by seton carr which we had advised them to try they took a day's rest returned in one day to b and made their camp next night at the spot where the river issued from the ice leaving this at four thirty a m they had nearly got to castani by nine o'clock when gums who was on ahead reported that the lake was too high to cross and they turned towards the old route on the agassiz finding very bad going while thus engaged they saw the smoke from the fire i had lit and gums then said he could get round by the guyot but as he had previously denied the existence of such a way the men declined to try it and after hailing us without understanding what we said in reply went on to d and so round they were all in good health but george the only one who had no boots was very footsore h came in about a half an hour later somewhat annoyed by his wild goose chase splashed with glacier mud and hoarse with shouting after the lost caravan but he was too hungry to waste time in grumbling and after supper we turned in early at this camp in consequence of e's snoring which had become perfectly maddening packed like sardines as we were i turned round and slept with my head where my feet used to be w occasionally did a little snoring in a mild way but was nothing to e who not only snored his breath in but blew it out again with a puff like a locomotive sleeping with his head under the blankets because of mosquitoes increased the evil and it was no good my poking or kicking him for he always went to sleep again long before i did wednesday the twenty fifth after the fatigues of the previous day the men slept late gums went to fetch some of the indians blankets etc left at d at nine o'clock e and nearly all the men got under way followed shortly by h and w while an hour later i brought on mike george and gums who went very slowly and did not reach the edge of the glacier till twelve here i had a row with gums who had apparently gotten out of bed wrong leg foremost and maintained that his load was too heavy threatening in order to lighten it to throw away the frying pans and kettles as he had been ahead of us most of the time so that i had to call him back more than once and was besides much the strongest of the three indians with me this was absurd and i nearly lost my temper with him a fatal thing when dealing with the natives 
but curbing my righteous indignation i merely remarked hallo kettle hallo muckamuck i.e no kettles no supper and leaving him to digest that information and a ship's biscuit to soften it down i went on after the others who were vanishing over the glacier for this my conscience rather reproached me afterwards for without amounting to an ice-fall there were some rather ugly crevasses a little way on in which laden men might conceivably have come to grief but they turned up all right i had caught up most of those ahead and had relieved w of the camera which he was carrying when we heard shouts from e and shorty at the edge of the glacier with the exception of h who was on ahead up the glacier and took no part in the struggle that ensued we hurried on and found that as they got on to the hillside they had espied a small flock of geese on a pool between the glacier and the land shorty fired his pistol at them on which instead of flying away they swam into a cave under the ice and he ran down and blockaded them while e shouted for us we went down to the water and with some difficulty reached the mouth of the cave on pieces of ice that were more or less afloat to get there we had to pass under a slender ice arch which seemed to be on the point of falling but once on the ice blocks we were quite safe accordingly shorty w and i commenced firing whilst the others guarded the exit as best they could and a wild scene ensued e in his excitement slipped into the water where he grabbed no less than three geese but was only able to secure one with which he retired to shore terribly numbed meanwhile a good many had got out of the cave but to our delight they could not fly the old ones being in molt at the time and the young ones being still flappers so that after much stone throwing firing and occasional use of ice axes we found ourselves in possession of ten geese two i believe escaped under the ice one badly wounded we then pushed on after h bearing our spoils with us and camped about four o'clock in a most lovely spot at the west end of the shea hills just at our back was a little lake about two hundred yards long in which we used to bathe and in front of us rose our mountain partly concealed by a group of fir trees to our right the last timber that we met with though i saw three dead trunks on the other side of the tyndall glacier we made a tremendous supper off of stewed goose and applesauce and afterwards decided to cross the glacier next morning to the site of schwatka's last camp where though there was no timber we could see that there was plenty of scrub probably alder like that surrounding us there was a most lovely sunset but directly afterwards it got very cold and we rapidly sought our blankets end of chapter four chapter five of with sack and stock in alaska by george broke this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil schempf chapter five further advance and my retreat thursday the twenty sixth a beautiful sunrise ushered in a splendid day and we turned out at four o'clock at five thirty ed with matthew and mike started down to bring up the stores left in the cache by the guyot glacier and a half an hour later the rest of us descended the slopes to the guyot as a long lake cut us off from going directly to the tyndall glacier once on the ice we curved round to the north making for the northeast extremity of the opposite hills the glacier was fairly flat and not much broken though there was a good many small crevasses in the white ice as we approached the hills all these glaciers are shrinking so rapidly that crevasses generally of considerable size are always to be found anywhere near their edges and as these are all naturally nearly always parallel to their direction they are sometimes a great nuisance we got on to the hills at nine thirty gums showed us schwatka's last camping place and after rummaging about a bit in the bushes produced the niagara crampons brought by professor libby the last hill which rose about two hundred feet above the glacier was almost isolated from the rest and we pushed on over the low col between it and the main mass putting up several coveys of ptarmigan as we went over the grass and through patches of alder scrub in a few minutes we came to the glacier again 
between it and the land was another small lake on which were numerous geese but we made no attempt at the time to molest them two fair-sized streams ran into this and as gums declared wrongly as usual that we should find no firewood further on we halted directly after crossing the first of these the men then returned except jimmy and billy who were to stay with us as before shorty and harry were to remain at camp g and the rest to go down to the beach and return in about ten days by which time we expected to have done our possible though our hopes of getting to the top were very faint by this time as they departed along the edge of the lake we saw them waving and pointing but could not make out what it was all about after resting a while h and w went off to explore while e stewed a goose and i made bread and pitched the tent our camp was on the edge of a low cliff above the stream and at the extreme verge of this a bear had been squatting in the long grass the indians utilized this spot as their camping place h and w did not return till half past eight decidedly despondent they found a relic of seton carr on the tyndall glacier in the shape of an empty tomato can we came to the conclusion that we should have to go on a good deal nearer the foot of the mountain before establishing a base camp and that we must get hold of lyons and shorty friday the twenty seventh we spent a quiet morning looking over our stores and made the painful discovery that a large portion of the oatmeal biscuits which had not before been unpacked had gone mouldy so we spread them out in the sun to dry directly after lunch w went off to sleep at g and bring men back next day and h and e took the indians with light loads to the proposed site for the new camp the disadvantage of which was the apparent absence of fuel i followed up the course of our camp stream finding fresh and large bear tracks to a curious cirque a promising couloir filled with hard snow presenting itself i worked up to a height of perhaps two thousand feet when there came a break in my gully i tried to turn it but the rock was of the same rotten clay consistency that i had before encountered and i had to give it up so glissaded down to my couloir and returned to camp where i had got supper ready by the time the others came back saturday the twenty eighth the nights were now very cold but the weather continued glorious the indians got off at seven thirty and we followed them in a few minutes about a hundred yards beyond our camp the second stream had cut a deep precipitous gully but we had found a good place to cross this just opposite to where a small stream came in on the other side and we then followed up this stream flushing sundry ptarmigan there was very little scrub here our route lying over what were apparently grassy uplands in reality there was little or no grass the vegetation consisting of willow herbs veratrum ranunculus mallow violas and many others some of which were strange to us but doubtless common enough in america i noticed a scarlet flower which i had seen in abundance on the pacific slope of the canadian pacific railway which is i believe known to botanists as castilea miniata it is something like a rattle but the calyx is scarlet and the real flower green or at least it looks as if it was just as we were getting on to the glacier which was here a slight outflow from which the stream that we were following up emerges we saw a brown bear about a half a mile ahead on a green knoll which was nearly surrounded by ice he said how easily we could cut that fellow off if we only had our rifles and we sighed in chorus a little later we found that had we been able to attempt such a manoeuvre it would only have ended in gnashing of teeth for our furry friend on seeing us had gone straight down on to the glacier and we now saw him a mile away going straight for st elias and steeple chasing gaily over the intervening crevasses we had a rather bad bit of ice here and in the future the men always went over the hill where his bear ship had been which was fearfully steep but saved a good piece we then crossed two glaciers coming in from the west which were curiously different in appearance the first subsequently christened the daisy glacier was about a mile wide and six miles long beautifully smooth and white with hardly a crevasse in it except at its junction with the tyndall at which point it was lower than the glacier into which it flowed the other which we called the coal glacier 
was rather smaller say five miles long by twelve hundred yards wide it was a good deal broken and was covered with debris among which we found lots of coal which burnt fairly well in our campfire the mountains adjacent were sandstone with great seams of coal plainly visible the amount of debris on the surface of the coal glacier protected it so much more from waste than the daisy glacier that its level was about the same as that of the tyndall on the north side of this we put down our packs and the men returned to h for more with instructions to bring up a load of fuel as well this proved to be unnecessary as there was still enough alder around camp i to supply us with firewood h e and i then went up the tyndall glacier we had gone about a mile and the others were some little way ahead when in jumping a crevasse the elastic of my snow spectacles gave way and one of the glasses got broken as they were my only pair and i am hopelessly short-sighted so that ordinary ones are no use here was a fearful catastrophe i shouted to the others that i was going back and returned shortly to camp from previous experience in switzerland i knew i could use no makeshift without fearfully delaying the others the risk of ophthalmia too from which i had once suffered was not lightly to be risked in these desert places and i reluctantly came to the conclusion that i must abandon all idea of climbing it was a fearful nuisance after coming so far but was partly attributable to my carelessness in not bringing two proper pairs instead of these and a ramshackle old pair which i found at sitka to have come to grief on the journey this was due to the haste with which i had had to leave england my first idea was to return to the beach so as not to be wasting the food we had brought up with so much labour but no one could be spared to go down with me and the others were opposed to my going alone so i consented to wait for them i then pitched the tent to do which i had to excavate part of the hill and remove a good many boulders about six o'clock the shrill whistles of the marmots which were very plentiful here heralded some one's approach and a few minutes later w arrived followed by the four men h and e came in ten minutes later having had rather a bad time among the big crevasses of the tyndall glacier many of which were more than partly covered with snow shorty said they were waving at the lake as they went down to point out that the geese were leaving the water and climbing on to the moraine so that we might have cut them off but we had not understood sunday the twenty ninth a cool gray day with high clouds the first break in the brilliant weather which began on the twenty first the other three with lyons and shorty left at seven a m to make a high camp on the other side of the tyndall glacier they took the big white tent and the edgington ground sheet with provisions for about four days their intention being to try to reach at least the upper rim of the so-called crater on the south arete soon afterwards i took billy and jimmy leisurely down to camp h for more stores and as shorty had said my going round the lake sent the geese up the moraine billy and jimmy lay in ambush and succeeded in slaying four with ice axes i got back first to camp h lit a fire and had to make a damper as there was no baking powder in the sack of flour there by making it quite thin it turned out very palatable and after lunching off this and some of the dried salmon which was a trifle high by this time we set off home again billy carrying the hams fish beans and one goose jimmy a box of stores and medicines and another goose while i took the other two we plucked singed and cleaned them all and then buried three in the snow on the glacier we had the fourth for supper with an entree of foie gras not very gras and bacon and as i felt lazy i commanded billy to make the bread the result was so excellent that he remained chief baker while i was alone and i fancy he washed his hands quite as often as i did at this camp there were hardly any flies or mosquitoes the former of which plagues had been terrible down at h after supper the men went after marmots but of course without getting any and i saw them clambering up and down the most breakneck looking places behind the camp they showed no distaste for ice but they were never on snow and we never had occasion to use the rope with them monday the thirtieth in the morning there were light clouds but the sun was more or less visible and from its position i judge we got up about eight o'clock finn and h were the only two whose watches were still going 
and they didn't agree particularly well i spent the morning in camp washing myself and my clothes cleaning my revolver etc in the afternoon i set out up the rocks behind camp they were very rotten and i got into considerable difficulties especially at one point where my foothold having disappeared i dangled for some time by my fingers in imminent expectation of returning to camp in a rather undignified not to say disorderly manner at last i got a knee up on the ledge and soon stood on the ridge in which was seen a large seam of coal six or eight feet wide along this crest then over snow beds and then up more rock always more or less rotten i reached a height of between four and five thousand feet from which i had a magnificent view of the wide sweeps of the tyndall glacier below me but to the north and west i was cut off by the spurs of the peak i was on it was very thick in the south and rain was evidently driving up so i determined to descend promptly and by making a detour to the right found a much easier way down and got in just as the rain began it was only slight and kindly left off during supper but then went on all night tuesday the thirty first in the morning the camp was enveloped in thin clouds as the sun was quite invisible we had no ideas of time but just after breakfast while we were still sitting round the fire the rain having let off and the clouds dispersed a good deal the men suddenly said coots the guttural being the same as in the arabic kamshin something like the german ich and looking up at once i saw two bears leisurely crossing the stones on the coal glacier about three hundred yards off going diagonally across the point below us hurriedly telling the indians to keep quiet i sneaked down to the tent got h s big telescope how i longed for a rifle and had a splendid view of them the first was the much talked of blue bear at last the body was slate color much lighter on the back with a well-marked white crescent on the shoulders while the head was nearly if not quite black he was decidedly smaller than the other which was an undersized cinnamon the blue one was also much neater looking and smarter in his gait the pair resembling a park hack followed by a cart horse the brown one had i think seen the tent for he kept stopping and staring in our direction but the blue kept quietly on and when he reached the point at about two hundred yards from camp he lay down in the long grass the other came on after him but instead of lying down wandered about in a restless manner after about five minutes the blue one got up and followed by the brown came leisurely towards us along the slope i heard the men whispering nervously together behind my back and when the bears were about a hundred yards off they couldn't stand it any longer but gave vent to a most fiendish yell which made me nearly drop the telescope while the bears puffing and snorting rushed wildly up the hill and disappeared over the ridge i went down to inspect their tracks at a place where they had crossed a small patch of snow at the edge of the glacier and found them to be totally different the blue had gone with his heel down the whole time like the black bear while the brown's track showed only the print of the fore part of the foot from this and from the general appearance of the animal i have but little doubt that these blue ones are a variety of the black bear no doubt as in the case of the black bear in other parts of america they will breed with the brown ones and hence puzzling variations are met with such as a skin i afterwards saw at yakutat which had been obtained near dry bay and was of a uniform yellowish gray halleck is the only author on alaska in whose works i have found any mention of this bear he says our new alaska page one sixty six up on the ridges back of mount st elias which constitute a favorite sick hunting ground for goats is found a bear similar to the rogeback or silver tip of the rockies but of a beautiful bluish under color with the tips of the long hairs silvery white the traders call it the st elias silver bear in another place page one sixty he says besides there is a small albino bear found on the coast which is known as the coast bear being white and a good deal about the ice in winter some have supposed it to be a variety of polar bear but the zoologists dispute it my own impression is that these bears are the same the white variety not being an albino but the blue bear with its winter coat on 
i could only hear of two of these white bears having been killed one at chilcat the other on the taku glacier near juneau and this latter was described as having been almost white the blue skins are also very rare as much as seventy five dollars being given for a good one they seem to rather prefer the company of their brown brethren as shorty a few days later saw three bears on the glacier of which one was brown and two blue and anthony the sitka watchmaker whom we first met at yakutat whither he had come prospecting up the coast met four near dry bay some brown some blue but i forget the exact proportion after lunch i set to work to prepare a sumptuous supper as i expected the others back that evening i made a pudding by boiling rice and dried peaches together and even added some sugar which had become a rare and precious commodity so that i did not use it while the others were away i then left the pot in the snow to cool put a goose to stew on a slow fire and wandered up a little way beyond camp to make a sketch of the glacier about five o'clock the weather improved the clouds gradually disappearing and the sun being pleasantly warm the others did not return and the pudding was so good that about half of it was eaten at supper but i put the rest by for the next day after supper i went out on to the tyndall glacier and had a grand view of the mountain though there were still some clouds about i could see no sign of the others but took a lot of bearings wednesday august the first it was so cold in the night that i woke up several times and got up pretty early having the tent all to myself and without the ground sheet no doubt contributed to this making bread for breakfast exhausted the flour so i started the men off to get some more from camp h and went down with them as far as the daisy glacier on the way i had to pitch into master jimmy pretty severely the crevasses at the junction of the coal and tyndall glaciers gave us some little trouble from having kept too near to the latter and one of these was spanned by an exceedingly frail snow bridge merely glancing at it i went some thirty yards lower down and looking back as i crossed saw to my horror that though billy was following me all right jimmy who had been a little behind was crossing the rotten bridge which he traversed in safety but two or three strokes of my ice axe sent it tinkling into the depths and why it did not give way with him is a great mystery jimmy looked rather awestruck and i pointed out to him with some vigor the necessity of following absolutely in my tracks the weather was again perfect and on arriving at the daisy glacier i let them go on while i turned on to the glacier up which i went for nearly three miles when my eyes began to ache a good deal and as some shrunds appeared which threatened to prove awkward for a solitary climber i returned in the lower part of the daisy there are hardly any crevasses and in consequence there are some very fine moulins while the surface was there in many parts very swampy if such an expression can be used a thin crust of snow overlying the wet glacier as i had expected it had a small outflow on its southern side about a half mile from its junction with the tyndall and the stream from this augmented by another from the latter glacier runs into the little lake by camp h and so gets back to the glacier i made a slight sketch of mount st elias from the terminal moraine and got back to camp about one o'clock estimated visiting on the way the big blocks on the coal glacier the biggest of which probably contained about six thousand cubic feet i found that the others had been over for stores and the kerosene stove and h had left a note saying that i could go down and wait for them at g and that they would be back in four days among other things they had carried off the small kettle with the remains of the rice pudding and so got their share after all they left the skins of four young marmots to be stretched and dried these afterwards vanished when we were camped at yakutat presumably the prey of some indian dog the men came back about two o'clock and after lunch we also went hunting marmots which they called tsak but though we got pretty near one or two and dug up a great deal of the hillside the only results were the expenditure of a few revolver cartridges and the not uncommon one of smashing the stock of an ice axe end of chapter five chapter six of with sack and stock in alaska by george broke 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Phil Schampf. Chapter 6 Back to the Shore. Thursday, the 2nd. In the odds and ends sack, I found an extra flannel shirt, and fortified by this, was not much troubled by the cold, though I was not too warm in spite of the thick vest, two flannel shirts, leather waistcoat, Norfolk jacket, and Mackintosh that I put on before creeping into my blanket bag. I had announced to the Indians that we were going back, and their delight got them up first for a wonder, though indeed as we returned they were generally the first to move, in their eagerness to escape from the detested country. At this camp they had been chanting the most doleful ditties, and when I inquired what it was all about, they said, Siwash sick tum tum, want go home. Among Indians, the tummy is generally regarded as the seat of the feelings. To get everything into one load, the packs had to be very heavy. Billy had about a hundred pounds, and Jimmy very little less, while in addition to my own properties, I had kettles, frying pan, and tent poles. We left a small cache for the others, and our last goose, but we hoped to get some more at H, and were off by about seven o'clock. On the Daisy Glacier, we found fresh bear tracks, much larger than those of the two who had paid us a visit, but we saw nothing of the beast himself. Putting up lots of ptarmigan in the hollow of the little stream by which we descended to cross the ravine, we went on past H to the site of Schwatka's last camp, flushing more ptarmigan by the stream there. Altogether, I fired five pistol shots at them and got a young one with my last. It was well grown and about the size of a French partridge. We pitched camp at the edge of the glacier, and after lunch, the men went back to fetch the things cached at H and to try for geese, but they only got one small one, all the rest being able to fly. Meanwhile, I took my ptarmigan on to the glacier to avoid the flies and tried to skin it. This was not very easy, as the bullet had smashed both shoulders, but I managed in sort of a way, and then went for a bit across the glacier towards the Shea Hills to get some idea of the lie of the crevasses. We had an excellent supper, and the men displayed marvelous appetites, eating the whole of their goose and the legs of my bird, and two goes of rice pudding, but I think they were then tolerably crowded. After this, I started to climb the last little hill, which looks like an island from the opposite side of the glacier, but coming on more ptarmigan, fired my last five cartridges and got an old bird. I ought certainly to have had two more, but the pistol was so foul that accuracy was impossible, while only three of the chambers would work. Coming back, I drove two or three young ones onto the moraine, and shouting for Billy and Jimmy, we pursued wildly for about half an hour, the men barefooted and I with only moccasins on, so that it would have been amusing to observe our skips and hops when we lighted on a sharper stone than usual. At last, the one we had selected was too beat to fly any more, and Billy finally succeeded in knocking him over with a better aimed rock than usual, most of their shots being awfully wild. Just as we were going to turn in, we heard a curious cry, something between the bleat of a sheep and the mew of a cat. The men said, rather doubtfully, that it was a bear, and shouted vigorously to frighten it away, but we heard it again afterwards, and I fancy it may have been a lynx. Friday the 3rd. I again woke several times in the night from the cold, and could hear the ptarmigan calling quite close to the tent. We did not get up till rather late, and got off about nine o'clock, leaving sundry properties which I intended Mike and Matthew who had been luxuriating at the beach to have the pleasure of fetching. Thinking, from my survey of the previous day, that we could improve on the way we had come, I struck right in nearly to the center of the glacier, and for a long way we had very good going with hardly any crevasses. But as we approached the two conical mounds which made such a landmark on the Tyndall Glacier, we got some very bad moraine indeed and in one place I nearly succeeded in breaking my leg by pulling a loosely perched boulder onto myself. It came to an end at last, and we got up to G about noon, where we found no sign of the other men. After pitching the tent and examining the cache, which, like all our others, had been left untouched by four-footed prowlers, we lunched, and then I had a delicious bath in the little tarn. 
the men slept most of the afternoon while i skinned the ptarmigan a futile task as it was found impossible to preserve the skins by the time i got home at supper time the view was unusually fine a thin layer of cloud hid the many crevasses of the guyot glacier as a veil conceals the wrinkles of a faded beauty while above this the peaks to the west showed with unusual grandeur especially the long snow-clad mass which we had christened snowshoe mountain later on the clouds thinned off a great deal and st elias which had been banded with mist all day came out quite clear the flowers on the hills especially the violets were mostly over but i found a fine rose-colored lupin among the blue ones at the edge of the lake saturday the fourth the day dawned brilliant fine and hot after a bath i mended my clothes and then putting my luncheon in my pocket wandered over the hills taking a good many bearings with the sextant as i came leisurely back along the edge of the glacier lake which was very bad walking i flushed sundry ptarmigan one of which an old one perched in the top of a dead fir tree just as i reached the end of the lake i heard shouts and hurrying to the glacier found h and w e was behind with the men and as shorty had a bad ankle and the packs were very heavy we sent the indians to help them while they related their adventures i got supper ready for them after leaving camp i they crossed the tyndall glacier for about half an hour and then put on the rope the crevasses were very bad and covered with rotten snow so that it was with difficulty that they made their way to the foot of mount st elias and established a camp on the last grassy slope that was visible the scenery was very grand resembling the view up the mer de glace from the mont but on a far larger scale the double ice fall of the tyndall glacier was well seen divided by a small island of rock further to the right were two very steep and narrow glaciers resembling frozen waterfalls this camp had been reached at half past ten three and a half hours going and at twelve they sallied forth to explore and mounted round the camp hill keeping it on the right two hours up a rather steep ascent brought them to the top of a snow coal connecting the camp hill with one of the arêtes leading to the rim of the crater which was then their object the arête was a blue shale everything giving way directly it was touched but apart from that the climbing was not difficult and after reaching a height of about six thousand feet they turned back at four thirty p m undecided as to the morrow having left the stove and kerosene behind they expected to live on cold food but found moss and shrubbery enough to make a small fire next morning they left at eight a m with the intention of continuing the same arete but in half an hour they changed to the next one on the left and in two hours reached a height of slightly greater than that of the day before the walking was terrible over loose shale and steep dirt giving no real foothold they followed the edge of the arete for the rest of the day sending down quantities of stones then came a little snow part of which was solid ice and h had to cut a hundred and fifty steps which took the best part of an hour and a half at four o'clock they reached the summit of the arete but though on the brink of the crater could see nothing owing to mist the height seven thousand seven hundred twenty five feet was at all events better than seat and cars and they built a cairn and left the flag hardly hoping to get any higher after a hasty lunch they descended reaching camp at ten p m they could see that the tyndall glacier makes two long and beautiful sweeps round the foot of st elias full of tremendous crevasses and though if time were no object it might be possible to ascend it it could never be a practicable route to the summit the next day they made a day of rest which was diversified by shorty and lyons slaying in the morning with stones eight out of a covey of ptarmigan while in the evening they succeeded in smoking out and killing four baby marmots on wednesday they all came over to the coal glacier camp in an hour and a half found me absent and carried off the stove and sundry stores including the rice pudding in the evening they went up to a bit of moraine east of and just beneath the snow call connecting the camp hill with their first arete 
and slept there leaving at four forty next morning and keeping steadily up the arete till their arrival at the top there was no difficulty it was only a sort of treadmill over the loose shale and slate they kept to the edge of the arete the whole way and at the point where it articulates with the mountain they went first up loose debris and then over a little snow whence they diverged to climb a nice bit of sandstone and reach the rim of the crater at seven ten after ten minutes halt they continued along the brink to the summit of the arete climbed on the thirtieth of july which was reached at seven forty they then steered northwest over the snow towards the upper lip of the crater having to double back considerably to avoid some shruns once above these they ascended a little snow and then a tedious slope of loose shale while on their right was a steep snow slope in too dangerous a condition for climbing near the top of this they met with some more fine rocks of grey sandstone which gave them their second ten minutes of real climbing and they then rested for lunch from ten ten to ten fifty five the aneroid gave a height of ninety five hundred feet and to reach ten thousand they had to go a considerable distance just above the sandstone rocks came the top of the snow slope alongside of which they had been climbing it proved here to be ice and they had to cut up it slanting to the right so as to reach the top where a sort of cornice was at its best the last part was dangerous the ice being loose and granular while the last few feet were so steep that it was necessary to kneel in the steps above this they found a snow field stretching in waves round the brink of the crater the snow was very trying being often above the knees while large crevasses separated the elevations from the depressions and wherever the grade was steep the snow changed to ice they kept on this till they were about due north of the crater when they had their second lunch at the height of eleven thousand three hundred seventy five feet as shown on working out the boiling point observations and then went on to the foot of the highest rocks that formed a part of the eastern edge of the crater these were steep and mostly covered with snow in which were large crevasses the snow mounted in sweeps and terraces to the top of the rocks which they estimated as about a thousand feet above them they would have much liked to have ascended these but the day was advanced the wind rising and the sun spoiling their steps so that they thought it more prudent to return at this point they were above the coal joining hayden peak to mount st elias but could not see the coal itself they could see however that the final peak which they then estimated as being some six thousand feet above them would be difficult and perhaps impossible from this coal on the further side it would first be necessary to climb east to avoid an overhanging glacier then to ascend over rocks snow and some green ice which might perhaps be avoided by some steep rocks to the left but all the climbing up this first thousand feet would be very severe afterwards it would be easier up a snow slope till above what appears as a mound from below fifteen hundred to two thousand feet above the coal then north over a comparatively level snow field then up steep snow and rocks to the edge of the true south arete which runs up for about four thousand feet to the summit chiefly consisting of snow and not steep the upper half is steeper but there is no rock and there would be no difficulty there or on the southeast face unless as is very probable what seems to be snow is in reality ice lower down they could see distinctly that this was so and therefore abandoned all idea of sleeping on the coal the southwest face is a mass of hanging glaciers the brow on which they were is seen from below as a wall of snow fringing the top of the crater on the other side this snow falls away rapidly to the glacier which winds down from the northeast to the head of the tyndall glacier from there no route to the coal could be made as the ice is far too broken and should any one force the tyndall icefall his best course would be to cross the glacier to a low rock arete which would take him to some snow fields whence he might turn west and gain the huge northwest arete of the mountain by this he could reach the west shoulder and the way would be simple the weather being perfect their view was magnificent to the northwest the ranges were low 
but the glaciers went winding out of sight mount wrangell could not be seen but fair weather was distinctly visible on their descent they found the snow and steps much worse they left mrs hayden's flag in a meat tin under a pile of stones at the foot of the sandstone rocks where they made their first lunch as above this there was no place of security and got back to camp about nine o'clock next day they crossed over to camp i and on the saturday descended to g going at shorty's suggestion all along the tyndall glacier but came to the conclusion that it was not an improvement as the other men had not turned up billy and jimmy were informed to their great disgust that they would have to go next morning and fetch the cash left at j sunday the fifth w woke us all up in the night by shouting in his sleep lions lions a serac is falling on the tent for which he was unmercifully chafed the indians arose at some unearthly hour and went off to j getting back at eight o'clock at six thirty a m w went off to try and turn the west end of the opposite range which we had christened the ptarmigan hills he could persuade no one to go with him as we all believed first that the hills could not be turned owing to the crevasse state of the guyot glacier and secondly that if he did turn them he would only see another point beyond we bathed and sketched and about noon ed and finn turned up followed half an hour later by matthew and gums who had laudably endeavoured to find a better way through the crevasses on the guyot glacier but had failed signally gums had come up in mike's place as the latter's feet were very sore they had had rainy weather on the beach nearly the whole time a lot of the akatats had been there sea otter hunting with considerable success and jack dalton had camped for one night he brought the news that the body of a white man had been found at point manby thrown up with a fishing dory the poor fellow must have got wrong among the breakers at night and he had thrown out a drag to keep the boat head on to them but he must have swamped as he reached the shore from the tracks they saw he was able to crawl up the beach on his hands and knees into the bush and whether he died there from exhaustion or was killed by a bear no one could say but it is to be hoped he was dead before the bear got him no one recognized the boat or knew anything which might lead to discovering his name they buried what was left of him there and put the dory over his grave our men had a fair time among the flesh pots on the shore as though the indians had got no more seals they had shot several swans and geese the men came up in two days making a camp as before at the place where the river issues from the ice but succeeded in getting down in one day of sixteen hours the water was very high and they had to make a raft before they could cross one creek after lunch lyons and i went after ptarmigan with our pistols shorty also started with the rifle which had been brought up from the first cache but his leg was too bad and he had to go back he looked for me to give me the rifle but i had vanished down a ravine there were not very many ptarmigan while the ground was so broken that it was almost impossible to mark them i only fired two shots lyons was luckier firing ten or twelve and getting one bird which he nearly lost for he fixed it in his belt by the head and looking down after a time found the head at praeternia nil retracing his steps carefully he managed to find the corpse we heard w also popping away vigorously on the other side of the glacier but he returned brit wheel without having got round the end of the hills after supper finn went out with the rifle and got two ptarmigan he hit a goose but it escaped into the lake we managed to make an early start for the shore so as to avail ourselves of the continued fine weather and get back to yakutat as soon as possible monday the sixth moved by the hope of speedily leaving the regions they so thoroughly loathed the indians were astir early and by four o'clock the whole party was up finn fried the two ptarmigan for breakfast but as it was discovered that the indians had been greasing their boots with the fat in the frying pan no one seemed inclined to partake of the dish we got off by five thirty and went down to the guyot glacier along which we proceeded at a great pace as the packs were pretty light we got through the crevasses without much difficulty and though we had some rather muddy bits near lake castani 
we cleared the shea hills at nine o'clock abandoning to their fate a few stores which had been left in the cache made at the point where our trail from f struck the glacier ed matthew and mike having found more than they could bring up on july twenty sixth keeping about half a mile to the west of the depression between the glaciers we reached the head of the river at eleven the water boils out finely from under the ice but though it was higher than when the men had glass come up the gravel flat on which they had then slept being now covered the volume was not as great as i had expected being perhaps equal to that of the visp where it joins the rhone we rested a bit on the beach and then came on in very scattered order to the cache the two miles taking about two hours as the alder brush on the face of the moraine was very bad and the stream was too high for us to get along on the flats by wading every now and then as the men had generally been able to do h who stopped to photograph went all wrong away from the river towards camp c and as he came back fell foul of a wasp's nest and got stung in two or three places jimmy who was one of the first at the cache earned our high approval by coming back on his own accord to help shorty in with his load we were all collected by half past two and rested all the afternoon supper was at four thirty and we at last got hold of the dried vegetables which the men had always forgotten to bring up and made some splendid soup just above the cache e found a white willow herb and i collected some seed of the red kind to try in england while we were resting in the afternoon matthew told us that the indians called the river yaksatahi muddy harbor river and Mount St. Elias, Yatsataksha, Muddy Harbor Mountain. George, the second chief of Yakutat, afterwards told us that there used to be two villages, one on the sea and the other at the foot of St. Elias, but that the glaciers came down and destroyed them, according to him, in a single night. As the Alaska glaciers are all rapidly receding, this must have been a very long time ago. For a hundred years back, when the country was first visited, there was far more ice than there is now vancouver having been unable to enter glacier bay for the ice while icy bay even on modern charts is represented as being a v-shape from the glaciers running out on either side whereas it now hardly deserves the name of a bay at all meaning to make an early start we turned in at six o'clock but were driven wild by the millions of mosquitoes that invaded our tent by this time we were thoroughly inoculated against the effects of their bites but their continuous trumpeting destroyed all chance of sleep after a time we arose and drove out and slew as many as we could after which we endeavoured to close up every possible aperture our success was but partial but we managed to get a little sleep tuesday the seventh we got up at four a m and were off by five forty five an hour's steady going brought us down to Camp B, and we went on by the old route to the point where Gums declared Schwatka had had a camp. Here we turned to the left, instead of keeping down the main river. At first we had a good lot of wading, but presently reached some flats, over which we made more satisfactory progress. At this point some wild geese were discovered far ahead, and Shorty set forth to stalk them as however he was unwilling to crawl over the wet mud his six foot four frightened them away while he was still three or four hundred yards off on these flats were a great many small frogs of which most of the indians were much afraid holding some kind of superstition about them but matthew and jimmy were apparently sceptics and the latter with a sly look at us put a frog on the back of billy who though his great friend was perfectly furious and for a minute i thought we were going to have a first-class row at last we approached the deep creek where the men had once had to make a raft now the crossing appeared feasible but it was hard to be sure as all the neighboring land on our side was under water in the midst of this was a stranded log where we rested and took off our coats fastening them on to our packs which we carried on our heads h planted the camera in the water and prepared to photograph the passage gums of course led and at the second attempt discovered a place where the water was hardly over his armpits this was all right for the taller ones of us but e went in well up to his chin as did finn who losing his footing vanished with his pack 
great was the dismay till it was discovered that he was only carrying the bacon jimmy also disappeared altogether and had eventually to be convoyed across by gums and matthew last of all came w and h the latter bearing the camera he chanced on a deepish place and nearly went under but struggled on quoting and nobly father tiber bear up his faltering chin which chin decked with a ruddy beard had dipped beneath the icy wave before he emerged on the other side three-quarters of an hour through the trees and then a little waiting brought us to the mouth of the first river at eleven o'clock and we halted for a little lunch and a great many strawberries which were not yet over in shady places or long grass we then pushed on along the beach to camp the packs being brought down the lagoon in the small canoe and arrived at one fifteen hoping to start at once for yakutat but the other indians had gone hunting and we had to await their return which was not till five o'clock after some supper we got off at six twenty it was perfectly calm and we didn't ship a drop of water or get wet above our knees there was a five gallon can of kerosene which we said could be left on the beach mike however wished to take it in the small canoe but gums after a lively argument settled the question by driving an ice axe into it it was a fair squeeze for twelve in the big canoe i curled up just forward of the bow oar the other three were in the stern and hardly so well off we rowed and paddled to cape sitkagi ten p m when a fresh breeze from the west sprang up and towing the small canoe we sailed to point manby which we passed at four a m wednesday the eighth the breeze began to die away and vanished at five so we had to row again and got to yakutat at ten o'clock the groff greeted us and gave us four breakfast which included the unwanted luxuries of butter and honey the men who were a little sulky after their night's exertions cooked theirs on his stove then h paid off ed finn and the yakutats and arranged to leave our indians in the village as before after which we went over to the swedish mission on the mainland opposite and encamped in the yard ed came too and finn followed in the evening we bathed in the sea which was decidedly cold but the lake at the back was too muddy and also too near george's ranch to be pleasant de Graff expected the alpha to arrive about the tenth End of chapter 6。Seven of With Sack and Stock in Alaska by George Broke。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Recording by Phil Schempf。Chapter 7 。Life at Yakutat。Thursday and Friday, August the 9th and 10th。We wandered about the two villages hunting curios, but without much result though i got a rather neat model of the skin bidarky we got some excellent clams from the indians and had a good lot of strawberries which w and i hauled we tried to arrange with ned to take us up in his canoe to disenchantment bay but there was a potlatch in prospect and he declined to make any agreement saturday the eleventh very fine and hot our indians came over by order and matthew and mike were set to cut wood while the others took the boat to fetch water an operation which involved some little time as the nearest good water was about a mile away having nothing better to do h undertook to make a pudding of cornmeal and raisins for supper while we were all sitting round watching the fire as was its wont began to collapse and the kettle of water for the coffee took a header into the ashes thank goodness said h it's not the pudding even as he spoke another log gave way and the pudding joined the coffee water however it was soon remade but proved better cold than hot just after supper great excitement was called by an aged crone who was leaning on the palings pointing out to sea and saying schooner but on bringing the telescope to bear it proved only to be a big iceberg drifting down from disenchantment bay in the evening sub chief george came round to pay us a visit and said that he and nine other indians had once seen the back of mount st elias while after goats and that it was a gentle snow slope they landed at cape yaktagi which he described as being a better beach than icy bay there used once to be a village there the westernmost point to which the Tlinkets ever reached 
but now only three tumble-down houses are left they went up the right bank on the river kotsach for a day and then for two days along moraine at the back of mount snowshoe and the range north of it which was green and nearly clear of snow on that side they then turned east for half a day over ice and saw the mountain as described in the afternoon murphy's little eleven-ton schooner the active came down from disenchantment bay where he calson and dalton had been prospecting and had found coal in a spot where it seemed so likely to pay that some of them went back later from sitka to winter there so as to begin working it directly spring began sunday the twelfth very fine with light west wind as we were short of meat lyons and i took the canoe along the shore towards ankau creek where we found several flocks of small plover and i shot about thirty i had only number four shot with number eight or ten the bag would have probably been doubled in the afternoon murphy came over w wanted to go down with him but they were already very full he managed it at last by exchanging places with finn who was to stay and go down with us monday the thirteenth the active sailed at six and w went over about four o'clock he must have left the shed door open and some dogs have made their entrance for h s sealskin gloves were found outside and my model badarky had vanished altogether ned subsequently discovered it unhurt in the bushes outside these siwash dogs were a horrid nuisance and we several times rose in the night to pursue them but without result as they always escaped by the holes in the palings before we could stop them up once they got into the store tent by digging under the side and went off with a bit of bacon and the only piece of cheese in yakutat tuesday the fourteenth this afternoon the potlatch began in the second house these potlatches generally follow a funeral or some great misfortune thus an indian at dry bay who possessed three large trading canoes had one of them wrecked and some men drowned on which he promptly held the potlatch and gave away the other two canoes and all the rest of his property with the view of appeasing the anger of the great spirit the potlatch is sometimes but very rarely held for the purpose of gaining influence in the tribe in order that the donor may some day succeed to the position of chief this one we attended was consequent on the exhumation and reburial of the ashes of members of the two families just before proceedings commenced matthew summoned us and ushered us in in great pew opener style we were rather surprised at finding blankets spread for us in the place of honor facing the door as we had been told they might perhaps object to our presence so we were pleased and said they really did know how to do things in yakutat about two hundred spectators crowded in and there was consequently a fairish frost a blanket was then held up over the small oval hole which served as a doorway and the play began the ravens seventeen men four women and three boys wondrously painted and arrayed came and thundered on the wall outside after which the old doctor who wore a curious wooden mask representing a raven's head crept under the blanket and singing and yelling postured slowly down the three or four steps from the door followed gradually by the rest howling at the top of their voices when they were all in they danced but only for a short time some of the headdresses made of ermine skins and abalone shells were very quaint they then retired and after a pause during which we all went out for some fresh air the eagles entered the same way this time we saw the old chief and doctor both skip into the house at first warning with somewhat undignified haste and when we followed we found them ensconced in the place of honor and realized that we had been intruders before though they had been too polite to turn us out we huddled into a corner and watched the performance which was much the same gums and jimmy were in great form skipping about as if they were birds and waving their arms wrapped in cloaks our george was also most resplendent having on his head de groff's big tin funnel decorated with skins and red feathers one blanket was then torn up and distributed and then came a long wait so h finn and shorty went back with the missionaries e lyons and i stayed but this time took up a position near the door so as to occasionally get a little fresh air 
the women drawn up in two rows on the days on either side swayed and bobbed chanting at the pitch of their lungs they all wore the same dark blue and scarlet cloak and had red feathers and worsted in their hair making a decidedly striking picture most of them wore shark's teeth earrings to which they attached an enormous importance the lowest price we heard of being twelve dollars for a pair after this a lot of blankets and calico were cut up and given away and we left them hard at it about five o'clock as the tide had risen in the meantime lions had to wade in a good way after the canoe which had been secured to the stump of a tree wednesday the fifteenth after breakfast i went off with finn and lyons in the canoe to ankau creek but the tide was running out so strongly that we did not attempt to go up it but landed and lyons and i went up along the shore while finn searched for strawberries of which there were still a few to be found we followed up the creek for nearly a mile but saw nothing in the way of game and as the rocks were decidedly unpleasant to our moccasined feet we returned to the canoe and crossed to yakutat where most of the indians were still in bed having kept up the potlatch till five in the morning and distributed some three thousand yards of calico according to de Goff. we lunched there and sailed home about four o'clock the chief's garden was being stripped of its produce turnip beet and a few onions with a view to the approaching feast thursday the sixteenth gray and cloudy with a southeast wind which ought to bring the alpha now de Groff came over to lunch and took a photograph of us in camp and also of the swedish mission the indians were potlatching again today one woman gave away twenty-one blankets and a lot of calico occasionally great swells like the chief or the doctor got a whole blanket these doctors or medicine men used to have tremendous power in the tribe but this has much diminished before the advance of civilization their initiation into their full m d degree used to consist in a prolonged solitary fast in the forest till overtaken by a sort of frenzy they rushed back to the village where such people as desired to show a fine religious fervor would offer their arms for the doctor to take bites out of other indians when dead are cremated but the doctors are buried in a little wooden hut in some isolated spot or on a point of rock overlooking the sea and of late years these huts have been ruthlessly ravaged for curios since the doctor's charms and other implements are always buried with him but if the sacrilegious prowler was caught it would be very awkward for him in a wild place like yakutat the common american term for these medicine men is shaman apparently a corruption of the russian shawan but the Tlingits themselves use the word ich. The doctor at Yakutat was a filthy old scoundrel, with hair about six feet long. He had been half blind for years, having at one time headed an attack against a French storekeeper, named, I believe, Belliot, but the men always spoke of him as Bellou, who had checked the onslaught with a well-aimed dose of sulfuric acid during the potlatch sundry relics of the deceased made their appearance and were wept over with much emotion genuine tears being produced in abundance some of the old men who had nothing else gave tobacco a small pinch being put in the fire each time for the spirits of the departed friday the seventeenth dull and gray and threatening rain yesterday and today the flies were something fearful and we had even to walk up and down when feeding while any liquid such as soup or tea was thick with them as the baking powder was all but finished finn who was supposed to be rather good at the art was deputed to make sourdough bread but it was not much of a success resembling plain heavy buns the leaven was presumably too new for afterwards it worked admirably the indians began their feast about four o'clock each man had his own bowl while by the fire were large dishes full of rice berries cooked in seal oil and what looked like some preparation of fish after a brief invocation a little of each was put in the fire and then the bowls were filled and they began i was over on the island by myself and h came across in the smallest canoe to fetch me halfway over we met e in another who unaware that his brother had started was coming over with the same intention and instead of being pleased at not having to go any further seemed to consider himself aggrieved we often saw siwash dogs swimming across the distance being quite a mile 
in the morning we purchased through mike two salmon for ten cents which sounds cheap but after all the money was wasted as a few minutes later billy and matthew turned up in a canoe with two dozen they had speared so we took six of the best saturday the eighteenth raining all day with some very heavy showers so we stayed in the mission most of the time the house consisted of one furnished room which hendrickson and lytle inhabited one unfurnished one which they politely put at our disposal and another large one at that time unfloored which was to be the schoolroom we said we would sleep in the house as the weather was so bad but at supper time it cleared a bit and h elected to stay in the green tent e and i went in and rolled up in our blankets on the floor which was distinctly hard in the other room hendrickson was reading to lytle the story of elisha and the shunamite woman rendered apparently into easy english for children his accent was most peculiar and e after listening a bit remarked a great many sibilants in that language aren't there being under the impression that hendrickson was sticking to his native swedish i roared so that i feared they would come and ask what the matter was but luckily they didn't sunday the nineteenth rain nearly all night and most of the day e and i got up about six o'clock roused by the men coming back with clams for which the tide suited last evening my watch began to go in a feeble manner and made three hours during the night in the afternoon e and i played a curious form of cricket on the beach with a wooden net float for a ball an axe handle for a bat and two ice axes for wickets having smashed two balls we had to desist though not before e had defeated me with great slaughter monday the twentieth wind still southeast but no alpha we were getting thoroughly sick of our enforced imprisonment in this place where there was literally nothing to do the village being hopelessly surrounded by bush and so far from the mountains that no hunting or exploring was possible for fear that the alpha should arrive while we were away tremendous rain all afternoon which cleared as usual about six o'clock the wind however seemed rather more southwest tuesday the twenty first lovely morning at last but hardly any wind my watch still kept going but only very slowly between the hours of seven and eleven something evidently clogging the works ned's canoe the one we had at icy bay was going back to juneau next day which offered a means of escape but he was taking a cargo of seal oil shorty however wanted to go but we preferred to keep him de graff came to supper and we had some whist afterwards keeping it up till the extraordinary late hour of half past ten when he took his departure by the light of a lovely full moon wednesday the twenty second perfect weather again shorty had sold the rifle he bought from w to sub chief george and finn ease to frank a friend of ned's this breach of the law rather annoyed us as we naturally thought the men had purchased the rifles to keep but we saw no good in interfering now that the deed was done our four indians came over about breakfast time to take e salmon spearing and reported that ned had not taken his departure last night so i said i would go with him and take finn to look after me h then proposed that i should take our indians who were eating their heads off to no purpose and shorty suggested that we might buy a canoe and all go down together so we went over to yakutat to make inquiries de graff admitted that all agreement with him was over on the twentieth and seemed to have but little hope of the alphas turning up now but believed that the leo or even the pinta would come for us canoes were to be bought for a hundred and twenty or a hundred and fifty dollars but h was rather unwilling to go in one so we came back at two o'clock for e's opinion but he had not returned we began boiling bacon and started finn on a big batch of bread he came back at four with a fair lot of fish unable to quite settle though against the canoe idea on the whole he and h went over to yakutat to decide and to fetch shorty while finn and i went on cooking they returned at seven thirty having concluded not to go and the siwashes refused to come in the canoe unless h did saying that they had not made an agreement with me but with him as they were all accustomed to canoes and matthew had done the trip twice before i do not think they were afraid except perhaps of hard work but merely that they found themselves in very comfortable quarters at yakutat drawing full pay and doing very little for it and wished to prolong that happy state of things as long as possible 
ned was willing to take any number of passengers to juno for ten dollars each but after much discussion it was at last settled that i should take lyons shorty and finn and try to get ned to go to sitka so i went over about ten o'clock with the two former and routed out ned who agreed to take us to sitka for eighty dollars half down as most of the people in the chief's house were asleep we curled up sub jove frigido on the stoop and were soon asleep end of chapter seven chapter eight of with sack and stock in alaska by george broke this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by phil Schamp. chapter eight yakutat to sitka thursday the twenty third up at sunrise the blankets dripping with dew as the morning was perfectly lovely and the mountains quite clear i roused de groff to photograph and then we went over in the big canoe to fetch finn and our things and said good-bye to the other two and to the missionaries we then returned to the island and cooked our breakfast on de groff's stove who was rather sad at our departure but brightened up before we went we managed to purchase a little hardtack and rice in the village but could not get away till after nine o'clock as ned in his delight at the prospect of such a lucrative voyage was boozing with a few select friends on hoochinoo a vile decoction they distill from sugar and was only got away when about half seas over at eight thirty h came across with a letter for his brother alfred and went back just before our departure we pulled to ocean cape which we reached at eleven o'clock and then set both sails wing and wing as the wind was dead aft though very light the result of ned's potations was that we jibed with some frequency and apparently becoming aware of this he transferred the steering lines to his young brother jack who with ned's wife and another indian named frank made up the crew and composed himself to sleep we sailed steadily on all day keeping five or six miles from the shore which is here a low sandy beach on which the pacific surf continually breaks so that it is always difficult to land and in bad weather becomes quite impossible and therefore this was the most dangerous part of our canoe journey at sunset we were nearly opposite the western end of dry bay and as the wind died we pulled for a bit but a land breeze from the north then came and though as it was on the beam we were sure to make a lot of leeway we kept the sails up and proceeded to arrange ourselves as best we could for sleep this is not very easy in a canoe even when forty feet long as the seats and cross pieces prevent any extension movements of the body but ned's bedding was allotted to me and nicely filled the space aft of the stroke thwart this canoe was fitted with four oars and mirabile de tu a rudder with yoke lines the only one i ever saw on a canoe all the others being steered by paddles washboards had also been put on her for this ocean cruise and we had to cut holes in these for the oars friday the twenty fourth splendid weather almost too hot at sunrise we hardly cleared dry bay but were some ten or twelve miles from land about nine o'clock the west wind came again but it was very light and our progress was slow in the extreme swarms of little divers kept appearing all around us and in the afternoon when all were asleep but ned and me two small plover came on board and stayed for some time at three o'clock the breeze died and then a puff from the southeast rather alarmed us and made us pull in for land then about eight miles off but it vanished again and we pulled steadily on till just at sundown we reached the indians regular camping place about four miles north of cape fairweather though somewhat protected the landing is through surf and we had accordingly to unload the cargo consisting of a few sea otter skins and rather over a ton of seal oil in square boxes and then to pull up the canoe we soon had a fire going and cooked some soup and salmon the former being much appreciated by finn who had been more or less seasick all day and got terribly chafed by the indians the night was so fine that we did not pitch the tent but just rolled it around us as we lay on the sand with the roar of the surf lulling us to sleep saturday the twenty fifth ned called us at five o'clock and after a hearty breakfast of fried salmon and cornmeal mush 
of which the latter we cooked a good quantity so as to be able to eat it cold in the canoe during the day we got off at seven thirty with some difficulty as the tide was ebbing and the canoe kept sticking as we piled the stuff into her and having to be moved down a little further i did not envy frank who had to hold on to the stern of the canoe which was bow on to the shore for about half an hour sometimes up to his shoulders in the icy surf in order to keep her straight and we were all more or less wet by the time we got off our frying pan which had long lost its handle still had the remains of the salmon in it and while shorty was trying to wash it in the sea it slipped from his fingers and vanished forever this was a terrible blow as all our bread was baked in it as we pulled to cape fairweather clearing the point at half past eight i was able to do a little more to a sketch of mount fairweather begun the night before it bears a curious resemblance to mount st elias not only in its own shape but also in that of the mountains immediately adjacent having the same black ridge on the left rising first into a hump and then into a huxley but without the teeth on the left of the top of the latter while on the right is a mountain wonderfully like cook a possible route from our last night's camp for the ascent of mount fairweather would be through the bush to the glacier behind along the course of the stream running into the sea close to the camping place then up the glacier for two easy days or even one fair one according to the state of the ice and then right up the west arete but the snow looked bad and the rocks though nowhere very steep seemed ominously smooth a fine wind increasing every moment now sent us along at a grand pace the water every now and then surging through the oar holes which we stopped up as best we could by covering them with the paddles about seven to ten miles north of our camp is a very large glacier the grand plateau of which the centre covered with moraine comes almost if not quite to the sea while on either side is a stream of pure white ice st elias was visible just over the point to the north of it but we afterwards kept too close to the land to ever see it again though it has been observed as far south as the entrance to salisbury sound a distance of two hundred and eighty miles as we got more to the south we could see that fairweather's hump was double-headed while huxley looked very like the rothhorn as seen from the riffle the west arete of fairweather now seemed worse there being a level jagged piece like the cre du col on the matterhorn just before joining the main mass of the mountain the upper part of the easternmost of the three southern arets looked feasible enough but the bottom was of precipitous dark brown rock to all appearance very little broken this arete would be reached by the glacier which runs into the northern arm of Latuya bay indians now shouted out schooner schooner and we were much excited intending if it should prove to be the alpha to get some tin luxuries and our mails from her but we soon decided that it was only a canoe then we lost sight of it for a bit but came suddenly on it again then it turned out to be only a floating spruce to the huge amusement of my crew with a real good wind we went flying along finely and passed the mouth of latuya bay at eleven o'clock the narrow entrance was quite smooth and we could easily have gone in we reached the great pacific glacier at two thirty this has a sea front of white ice a mile and a half long but though great pieces are constantly breaking off there are no bergs as the surf pounds them up directly the wind now began to slacken and we did not reach astrolabe point near which are some hot springs frequented by the indians till half past six while at sunset the breeze disappeared altogether ned with whom we as passengers never interfered in the management of his vessel seemed undecided whether to go on all night or not but the sunset had rather foreboded stormy weather and he eventually headed for land we pulled and paddled till ten o'clock by which time it was quite dark but the indians found a little harbor known as murphy's cove in a mysterious manner and we tumbled out over sharp rocks to a tiny sand beach where we made a fire and had some coffee ned pitched his tent frank and jack sleeping in the canoe which was moored while the rest of us lay about anywhere in the long rough grass by the fire we found some porcupine quills and there were other signs of indians having been there recently sunday the twenty sixth i woke the others at five the sky was gray and threatening and the wind seemed to be from the east all our stores were in a big rubber sack 
the mouth of which had not been tied up and jack in getting it from the canoe managed to drop into the sea the bags which contained the rice and oatmeal we promptly made porridge with the wet portion of the latter and put the rice near the fire to dry it swelled rather but there was not much of it and it all got eaten before it went wrong ned's big water breaker had apparently once contained seal oil and the taste consequently imparted to the water was most loathsome so that we were always careful to empty it out and fill it afresh before starting for this purpose i went to a little stream only a yard or two wide which ran into the corner of the harbour and found it perfectly choked with salmon in the first pool which was about as big as a large hip bath were between twenty and thirty varying from ten to twenty-five pounds in weight in the stream and on the edges were so many dead and dying ones that the water did not look tempting but it was the best that could be had we got off at seven thirty passing out by the canoe entrance where we had tried to come in the night before but had found the tide too low we only just cleared the bar now by those of the men who had gum boots on getting into the water and shoving we pulled out through small islets of rock but as we got to the sea a strong squally east wind came on and we had to take shelter at the indians usual landing place at cape spencer itself after going about five miles the cape is rather like a four or five pronged fork long promontories of rock running out with very narrow bays between we tried the most sheltered of these but found too little water at the entrance and had to go on to the next which was a good deal more exposed we got ashore at half past nine and as it was beginning to rain we pitched our tent on the shingle after which i went with ned to the river which was about a quarter of a mile off and ran into the bay that we first tried to enter it was a nice clear stream from ten to twenty yards wide and full of salmon which fled before us raising a great wave in the water he speared ten in about twenty minutes but they were all dogs but two a great argument is at present raging in america as to whether these dogs which have white flesh are spent salmon or not personally i do not think they are as at the mouth of this river there was a considerable fall at low water and i saw there the doggiest of dogs waiting for the tide to come up so that they might ascend the river when i returned shorty and lyons were asleep but finn cooked me some lunch he told me that the clinkets made hulacon oil by stacking the fish in a canoe till they are rotten then they add a little water to keep the canoe from burning and pile heated rocks on the mass drawing off the oil through a plug hole in the bottom in the afternoon it rained off and on and the wind rather went down but it would have been very bad in cross sound and though i think we might have got over it would have been very risky to try as we might so easily have been blown out to sea we now made the discovery that our bacon had gone rancid and was quite unedible though the grease could be used for cooking though nothing would induce the white men to touch it i found that boiled salmon roe if well cleaned was most excellent so i prepared a piece and laid it on a stone but when i turned round a few minutes later i saw a great raven flying off with it i got some more later as finn and the indians went to the river and speared and shot a lot of fish only bringing back the good ones they speared a salmon trout of five or six pounds but they threw each fish on the bank as they got it to be picked up on the way down and somehow missed this one so i never saw it about four o'clock the sun came out we seemed to be on the edge of the bad weather as to the north and west it was fine and clear but thick and grey to the south towards which quarter our cove faced in the evening it turned grey again and began to rain so after a supper of rice soup and boiled fish we turned in early monday the twenty seventh there was a lot of rain in the night and more wind so that the indians had to unload and pull up the canoe in which ned was sleeping in the morning there was plenty of blue sky to the north but the same strong east wind kept us prisoners at breakfast our scanty store of sugar came to an end this didn't much affect me but the men were grieved at having to eat their porridge plain the sidewashes now discovered frogs in the vegetation where they had pitched their tent they are very superstitious about these reptiles whose image often appears on their totem poles and accordingly move their tent down to ours though at the same time they seem to consider it rather a good joke 
i borrowed finn's gum boots and went up the river with the spear which had no barb so that it was not very easy to secure the fish when struck the indians used to flip them out onto the bank but my wrists were not strong enough for that with a thick twelve-foot pole and i had to hold my captive down till i could shorten the spear so sundry escaped but i got eight or ten following the river up for about a mile to where it got wider and shallower and some indians had at one time constructed a barrier and trap now very dilapidated with twigs and branches when i returned i found that ned's wife had washed the blacking off her face with surprising results i had sat at her feet for three days in the canoe under the impression that she was a hideous creature of about thirty but now she appeared to be about seventeen and really quite good-looking being as fair as most italians ned was himself a smart-looking fellow and they made a handsome pair though like nearly all these coast indians their legs were deformed from the continual canoe life all the women of these parts and a good many of the men blacked their faces in summer partly to preserve the complexion and partly to keep off mosquitoes they used to employ a mixture of soot and seal oil but now that the advance of civilization has introduced them to blacking they much prefer that my watch now took to going all right again the fine glacier mud apparently dropping out as it dried at noon it began to rain steadily and kept on till five when it kindly left off for a little so we turned out and had supper in spite of the rain finn had managed to bake some sourdough bread in our tin plates and we persuaded it to rise by covering it with our warm blankets though a good deal burnt in baking it was quite excellent and i particularly appreciated it as being the only crusty bread we ever had but the men didn't care for it a crusty loaf is always an abomination to an american and our preference for the outside always surprised our men it soon began to rain again so we turned in at seven and lay in bed talking lyons had been in france and germany as a child but did not remember much about his journey tuesday the twenty eighth in the middle of the night we heard the indians making a great noise and roaring with laughter and on one of the men going out to inquire we found that the little lake behind had so swollen by the continued rain that a stream had burst up through the shingle in the middle of their tent and swamped them out like the episode of the frogs they seemed to consider it an excellent joke though i should have been exceedingly annoyed had i had to move tent and blankets under pouring rain in the dark but the coast indian is a cheerful personage and quite unlike his statelier cousin of the plains the question of his relationship to japan i leave to wiser heads than mine it rained nearly all night and the wind was much stronger we lay in bed till eight thirty when shorty made us some cornmeal cakes as the oatmeal was finished it went on raining hard and we lay in the tent the wet coming through freely on to our blankets till half past three when it began to clear and the sun came partly out it soon went in again but the wind had gone round to the southwest so we had hope for the morrow wednesday the twenty ninth none of us except finn were able to sleep much owing partly to so much lying in the tent and partly to the influx of insect life which had appeared on the cessation of the rain small black spiders which bit like anything swarms of mosquitoes and the biggest sand fleas i ever saw they kept up such a pop popping all night by jumping against the tent that we thought it was raining when it was really quite fine we were up at five and off by six thirty when we pulled east for an hour round the point into cross sound here we found a dense fog and an icy cold northeast wind coming off the glacier in taylor's bay so we set sail and ran across the sound in an hour and twenty minutes to lisiansky channel between chichigoff and yacobi islands this channel is extremely narrow and we sailed down it with a light breeze for three hours seeing quantities of white-headed eagles on the trees we then reached the corner where the strait turns sharp to the west and landed for about an hour we found here a skull on the beach about which shorty and finn had an argument which culminated in the former betting twenty dollars to finn's watch on its being a deer's head but he lost for ned whom they appointed umpire pronounced it to be that of a seal we went on again at one o'clock pulling and paddling steadily against the tide and had almost reached the open sea at four thirty when the tide turned and a good northwest wind sprang up we found a heavyish sea outside still running up from the southeast 
but the wind drove us through it at a great pace and we passed cape edwards at about sunset we then got in among the fringe of small islands and landed at nine o'clock some six miles further on in a little harbour which took some finding in the dark we landed over some rather broken rocks and lyons was much taken aback at finding himself at the edge of what seemed in the blackness of the night to be a bottomless chasm though in the morning it proved only to be about four feet deep we lit a fire and prepared some pea soup after consuming which we curled up on the moss under the trees the men rolling up in the tent while i had blankets enough to take a nook apart the night was lovely and the starlight most brilliant thursday the thirtieth a beautiful morning i woke the rest at five and after some coffee and cornmeal mush we got off at six thirty and rode to the end of the islands by which time it was half past nine and the west wind came again according to custom about this period i recognized the conical top of mount edgecombe and pointed it out to finn who had not been in these parts before we reached the entrance of salisbury sound at noon and ate our one precious tin of corned beef which we had saved so carefully we flew down the sound at a great pace through crowds of porpoises at which the men tried several futile shots at one o'clock we rounded the corner opposite peril straits and saw a vessel coming towards us which we at first expected would be the idaho which on account of the crowd of tourists had been doing some supplementary trips to those of the ancon and the elder but as she got nearer we recognized the pinta since we were going about nine knots we did not want to waste any of our wind and merely ran past exchanging salutes about three o'clock the wind began to die away and at four just after we had passed st john the baptist's bay we had to take to the oars and pulling on steadily at a good pace we came in sight of sitka at about seven when i sent my previously untouched whiskey flask round and half an hour later we were ordering a sumptuous supper of clam soup halibut and venison while half the population were crowding round to hear our tale it was just in time to secure the leo a steam schooner of about fifty tons which would otherwise have sailed at midnight for port townsend and for four hundred dollars her owner consented to go up to yakutat and fetch the others h said they were wild with delight when they saw her round the point three days later but after all i had the best of it for they encountered a fearful southeast gale and after springing a bad leak had to run back to yakutat where they beached and repaired her and did not reach sitka till the seventeenth of september our expedition was a failure chiefly from the want of trained men to convey camping material to a great height and the next party would do well to take a couple of swiss porters we were wonderfully favored by the weather and were most fortunate in that out of our party of fourteen who went inland the only casualty was shorty strain and that did not occur till we had commenced the return journey but should any one think of organizing an expedition for climbing in the st elias alps i would strongly advise him to turn his attention to mounts fairweather and crillon for these latuya bay offers a first-rate starting point since there is in its recesses ample anchorage even for men of war while the peaks are probably not more than fifteen miles away and sundry expeditions of great merit might be made the height of mount st elias suffered a rude onslaught at the hands of a party of american surveyors in eighteen ninety but i feel tolerably sure in my own mind that the old height of nineteen thousand feet is the more correct one for the following reasons firstly the figures establishing the highest point reached as eleven thousand three hundred seventy five feet were carefully worked out previous observations had given the height of the crater's rim as seven thousand five hundred feet and the times taken by the other three a very fast party correspond very fairly so that we may assume this height to be fairly exact at this point they were above the coal but not as high as hayden peak and therefore probably about a thousand feet above the coal now from yakutat it is clear at once that this coal is barely halfway up the mountain secondly as i went down the coast in the canoe the weather was absolutely perfect and mount st elias clearly in view till the third morning when we lost it by getting behind cape fairweather i can clearly recollect how as we were pulling in to the landing-place north of cape fairweather on the second evening 
a peak stood up clear and sharp against the sunset sky with at least a third of its bulk above the horizon the mountain had never been out of sight and the sun was not shining on the snows so i do not think any assistance was gained from refraction as cape fairweather is distant one hundred fifty miles from mount st elias this would again make the peak about twenty thousand feet high milmore the steward of the pinta who knew the appearance of the mountain well assured me that on their voyage down from yakutat in eighteen eighty six it was in sight as far south as salisbury sound but i cannot help thinking some mistake was made between it and perhaps Krillin. however other people assured me that they had seen it when off cross sound with reference to the supposed volcanic origin of the mountain i think the main mass is certainly not volcanic but i brought home from the moraine of the tyndall glacier two or three pieces of red amygdaloid lava which i believe came from the red hills just south of the crater so that possibly this crater may be due after all to volcanic forces end of chapter eight end of with sack and stock in alaska by george broke